don't wanna let you know you're so hypnotic magical go 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 go
Welcome back to the Ellis Oval for this Jumbo Cast production of Tufts Football. My name is Jared Cohen. I'm joined by my good friend, Henry Burns, on color commentary, and we are excited to have you back with us tonight. We have a great matchup in store between the Tufts Jumbos and the Wesleyan Cardinals. Really a burgeoning rivalry between these two teams. Six straight matchups decided by one score or less, and a very close all-time record between the two teams, 24, 22, and 2. So if history is any indication, we should be in for a treat tonight. Both teams come into this game 3-1 and one towards the top of the NESCAC and have shown that they are not to be trifled with so far this season. Yeah, well, Jared, and that one in the Wesleyan loss column came last week against Colby. Uh, Wesleyan suffered a tough loss in overtime. They really, I don't want to say it was a fluke loss, but they had a few big mistakes, namely a missed PAT early and then a field goal that cost them the game at, as uh, time expired, which would have put them ahead. And then in overtime, they let Colby get ahead of them right out the gate. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Some costly mistakes last week, and in a conference, the NESCAC, where Trinity is so far ahead at the moment, really every mistake hurts. So even with the talent both teams have been putting out so far this season, they are both chasing Trinity, who is looking unstoppable so far. So really, a treat today we'll be able to see, can either of these teams put together a showing that convinces us they're able to vie for that top spot in the NESCAC? We will see if that's possible. All that being said, what are some of the things we're looking for today for either team to come out of this uh, this game Excuse me, with a win? Yeah, well, with Tufts, I'd love to see this offensive line step up. Uh, Wesleyan's coming off of a huge game last week uh, with, where, in which they had six sacks. So Tufts has only let up one sack this season, and uh, we need Sepalia and the boys up front to continue their success and really hold down the fort for Berluti in the offense. And if the O-line can build that base, I'd love to see the Jumbos revitalize the passing game. Last week against Bowdoin, they kind of had a slow game offensively. Berluti only threw 172 yards, uh, which is just under the mark of 230 they usually throw. And honestly, more, that 230 number came down because of last week's performance. Um, and usually we worry about other teams keeping up with the, with the Jumbos, but uh, this Wesleyan team is third in the NESCAC in scoring, right behind Tufts. So passing the ball well would be crucial to keep up with them. Speaking of the high-scoring Wesleyan team, a huge key for this defense is to make a damn red zone stop. This defense is the best in the league against the pass, but they have yet to make a red zone stop this season, allowing opponents to score 12 out of 12 red zone trips. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Really good insight right there. We're going to cut to a quick video for you guys, and we will be right back with more keys to the game and more insight going into this Tufts vs. Wesleyan matchup. Went over the tough skis to the game briefly. I agree with you 100%. Henry, want to see Berluti come back and reestablish that dominance that we saw so often these last couple seasons. And the offensive line has just been unbelievable so far. I want to see that continue into this game. But for Wesleyan, what do they need to do if they want to come in here and maybe surprise this Tufts team? Yeah, well, last week, like I talked about really in the intro, was the special teams error that plagued them. Uh, with the missed kick and a, and a fumble that they had on the, one of the opening kickoffs, uh, you really just can't have you can't afford those mistakes against this tough team. They'll make you pay. 
Uh, and if Wesleyan offense gets going, they're really difficult to stop. So I'd like to see them stretch out this Tufts defense. They have two of the top seven wide receivers in the league. They can really spread the secondary out and take shot plays. Uh, this will in turn open up the run game for the Wesleyan running backs, Flynn and Jennifer. And then moving over to the defensive side, Wesleyan needs to win the turnover battle. They're, they have elite corners. Wesley Abram and Jack Nally have five interceptions combined, and they will need to be involved big time today. And I mean, it's a really interesting matchup, probably the most interesting matchup we've had here on Jumbo Cast so far this season because hypothetically, both of these teams are teams that have strong offenses can really push the ball down the field but have shown the ability to shut down their opponents through the season the question will be can which team will come out on top today but one player in particular for the jumbos coming off of a dominant week last week could play a big role in this one that is defensive lineman Suleiman Abu Akel he had three sacks last game had no sacks going into that game and really is looking like someone who, if he continues to get playing time, could be a game changer. Yeah, I mean, he had no sacks and really no stats before that game. If we had been prepping for that game, I don't think we would have marked him down as a player to watch. But now coming into tonight, three sacks. Uh, last week, Tufts had five total sacks. So three of those coming from Suleiman. And on the season, they only have six. So he has half of the Tufts total so far. Yeah, the Jumbos had not done a great job creating pressure on opposing quarterbacks before last week and that big sack fest. But again, Wesleyan also coming off a game with over five sacks. So both teams looking to pressure the quarterback. As we said, the Jumbo's offensive line has given up only one sack on the season so far. So a little push and pull here, and we'll see if one team can really come out on top of the other. But at the end of the day, football is a quarterback-driven sport, and we have two great quarterbacks, arguably two of the best quarterbacks in the NESCAC coming into the game today in Michael Berluti and Nico Candido, and really two guys who are a pleasure to watch. Yeah, I mean, you just said it right there. I think, you know, Berluti and Candido are almost, I'd say probably two and three in the NESCAC in terms of quarterback ranking. Uh, both of them have just been elite through the air, and they really cause, uh, they're, they're a headache for the defenses to figure out. Uh, Berluti's a little bit more athletic on the run game, I think, than Candido, but we've seen Candido move, and uh, I think, it just really is tough to strategize as a defensive coordinator when you have a, a quarterback who has quite an arm and can, can be mobile and move out of the pocket and still make throws on the run. Yeah, Berluti's athleticism has really come in clutch for the Jumbo several times this season. And um, he has just really been a guy who the Jumbos, since the day he entered the game as a freshman, has been someone they can rely on. He is the quarterback, the captain of this offense. So him going against a guy like Candido, who so far this year has been arguably the best guy in the NESCAC, should be fun to watch. We're going to cut away quickly for the national anthem, and we will be right back here on JumboCast. Okay, do you want me to put it on the flag? Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars of the National Anthem, courtesy of the Tufts Beelzebub, 
We are back here at the LS Oval, a packed house for this Parents Weekend edition of Tufts Football versus Wesleyan. So as the crowd gets into it, we will be here on JumboCast. Super excited to get underway. And as we were saying, should be quite a game in store for us. Two great quarterbacks, two great offenses, plenty of offensive weapons on the field today. And should be plenty of entertainment. Yeah, and we're going to get to see this Jumbo's offense come out here first as they are uh, returning the kick. This is this is time to make a statement for the Jumbos. Need to score on this drive. You start off, you start off with a touchdown. You set the tone. Yeah, the crowd here would love to see the Jumbos march down the field and score right off the bat. But the Wesleyan defense is no joke. Second in total yards per game allowed in the NESCAC, and they want to come out and make a statement as well. So we will hopefully see Michael Berluti and the Tufts offense here just a second as we get underway here at the Ellis Oval kickoff. And we are underway, a line drive, returnable. Andre Smith has that, he will take it. And is brought down, breaks a tackle, and brought down right around the 20-yard line. Looked like he had room to run, but a strong play from the Wesleyan return team, and we will be starting at the 20-yard line. Well, there's there's a little bit of the special teams game that I was talking about. That's a great tackle. Way to, now you have tough starting inside the 25. That would have been a a better idea to take a fair catch right there, I think. And so here comes the Jumbos offense, Michael Berluti as usual at quarterback with Chartelis Reese beside him in the backfield. Usual weapons on the outside, 20 yard line, first and 10. Here we go. Starting the game with a handoff to Reese. He cuts up the middle, breaks the tackle, puts his head down, cutting left, and picks up a gain of round eight. Good hard run to start off the game. I like them setting the tone with <clears throat> with Reese early because last week he only had 26 yards. Uh, they need to establish him. I mean, we, he went off earlier this season against Bates, and he is second in the, uh, second in the NESCAC in rushing now with th 352 yards. So need to get him going. Yeah, last week definitely his weakest since he took the starting job in week two, but should see an attempt to get him going early from the Jumbos. Berluti looks to his sideline for a call. Yeah, well, Wesleyan does a good job here. They, they kind of disguise what they're doing. See how they're shifting everybody now. He's got Fleckner out wide on the bottom of your screen. Berluti now shifts Reese to his right. Takes the snap, it's play action, looks over the middle field, caught immediately by Cade Moore, and a first down, down to around the 40-yard line for the Jumbo's offense. Yeah, good pitch and catch, looked like a dig route by Cade Moore. Wesleyan was in a cover four, they just sat really far off and, and let him get that underneath route. And they'll take that every day if they can. Jumbo's get back to the line quickly, want to push the pace here on the first drive of the game. Same personnel on the field. First and 10 from the 41. Now drop back to pass. He's looking right. That ball goes through the hands of Fleckner and will be incomplete, bringing up second and 10. Got a little lucky there. Almost looked like that could have been picked off by the safety. It's interesting, though, the first two plays went to Reese and then Cade Moore. Cade Moore had no catches last week. Reese really was quiet, so... Looks like Tufts is, is looking to reestablish these these key players. And Fleckner right there, we've seen him get more involved in recent weeks, and he should be a big part of this offense going forward. Now Reese lined up behind Berluti, again looks to the sideline. I think you're right, this defense doing a lot to try to throw the jumbos off. Yeah, you see on the on the far side they have the corner walked up, and on the, the near side he's backed off. Looks like they usually run split field coverages. Berluti now. Play fake throws left, caught by Richardson, cuts up field and gets a first down, jumps over a defender out of bounds, but won't change the result. Another first down on this opening drive. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't matter what defensive coverage you run. If you have a guy like Richardson out there, it uh, doesn't make a difference because he will beat you no matter what. And we've seen before when this Jumbo's offense makes it easy on themselves, they can really get going in a hurry. They've done that so far. Down to midfield now, 49 yard line for Ludi. Empty set alone in the backfield. Three receivers to his right, two to his left. Again, looks to the sideline. Yeah, I'm curious to see how Wesleyan's going to handle the empty set. Tufts loves to run it, but uh, it's one of those sets that'll get you gashed if you don't cover it right. Berluti 
throws quickly. That ball is caught by Cade Moore, driven down, but a gain of around six on first down. Yeah, that's that's two to Cade Moore to start off the game. Currently their leading wide receiver. I, I like to see this. Yeah, Chartelis Reese not on the field for that play, but they brought in several wide receivers, Luke Botsford, C.J. Burton, who now come off, and they will attempt another one, two, second and five, excuse me, from the 44, now under 13 minutes in the first quarter. Moving the ball well are the Jumbos. Jumbo package on the offensive line. Berluti steps back, looks like a little bubble screen. Again, Cade Moore, stiff arm, cuts left and is driven to the ground. Short gain right there on second down. Yeah, made a nice little juke move to shake off the first tackler, but uh, really nothing in front of him after that. Couldn't get the blocks established outside and just usually on the screen passes, you like to set the edge and get your guy going to the sideline, but uh, looked like Wesleyan had overloaded that side, really nowhere to go. So no gain on that one. Third and five brought up. Bottom of your screen we have Wesley Abraham, the leading interception uh, the interception leader, excuse me, in the NESCAC matched up with one of Michael Berluti's favorite targets. So we'll see if that matchup comes into play. Third and five. Berluti again looking to pass, looking left. Plenty of time. He's going to step up and run. Cuts right. He's got plenty of room. Down past the 20 yard line. Tackled. And a long run from Berluti to set up another first down. His legs always a factor. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed there, but. Uh, Wesleyan ran a cover six, so that means split field. Half the field is cover four and the other half is cover two. Berluti just ran to the cover four side because the cover four sits your defensive back so far off the ball, there's so much space to run. He, I don't know that he ID'd that and decided to run, but there was just immense space on the right side. Great job to tuck and run and, and get a huge pickup. And it seemed as soon as Berluti got past that first level of the defense, everyone was chasing him as he cut down all the way past the 20 yard line. It'll be first and 10 from the 20, still in the first quarter. Two wide receivers split out. Jumbo package in the game. Another passing play, a little head fake. He's going to throw that wobbling a little bit. Caught, not, excuse me, not caught in the end zone. Crowd demanding for a flag. There was a little tussle for the ball. Ball was in the air for a long time. Excuse me on that one. He was absolutely walloped as he let go. And Cade Moore just couldn't come down with it. Yeah, I think they could have got a flag there roughing the passer. It looked like the, the defensive lineman hit Berluti up high. But uh, I don't know if, if you can really call that pass interference. When it's an underthrown ball, it's hard. That's a tough spot for a DB to get in. Your, your receiver is coming back towards the ball. But I like the shot play. You know, you had one-on-one -on -one coverage, no one over top. You trust your guy to make a play. Yeah, we've seen that before as well. The head fake from Berluti trying to set up a little out and up from his wide receiver split out. See what they'll do here on second and 10. This time a handoff to Reese. Puts his head down. Tackled by a gang of Wesleyan defenders gain of around five it'll be third and seven excuse me gain of three I like this drive tempo so far though they've really set Berluti up well a lot of pitching catches he's been making good throws it's really important to get your quarterback confident early especially at this level um, when you come out on an opening drive and you can just complete five or six passes you just you're you, you have you feel like you got a, a handle on the game going forward. So now third down, Jumbo's converting 41 percent of their third down so far in the season in the red zone. They are 11 of 15 in terms of scoring, but only seven of 15 in terms of touchdown. So a third down here to try to change that. Berluti, bootleg left, lobs it to the end zone, and it is caught. Touchdown, Jumbo's early in the first quarter. It is who else but Cade Moore. His leading receiver, one of his favorite targets, and the crowd is going wild here as the Jumbos take an early lead. Yeah, quiet last week, but silence no more. Heck of a pitch and catch right there. Berluti rolls to his left side, which is a tough throw to make as a right-handed quarterback. A flood concept, got your corner route, dialed it up beautifully. And so the Jumbos make a statement, march down the field and score on their first drive with the touchdown to Cade Moore. Extra point pending, but a strong statement from the Jumbos. Wesleyan will look to respond. Yeah, they moved the ball at will on that drive there. One of the better opening drives we've seen from the Jumbo so far this season, and a good sign to get it started early as the extra point is up and good. 10 minutes and 40 seconds remaining here in the first, and the Jumbos are already up 7-0, to zero, so it will be up to Nico Candido and the Wesleyan offense to change that as they receive the ball. Yeah, not not much, uh, not much, a better feeling than to get all your parents you know, involved and, and happy and getting in the game early. 
the, the crowd is buzzing so far. And uh, on Parents Weekend, that's exactly what you want to do to start it off. One of the bigger crowds we've seen at the Ellis Oval so far this season. Plenty of parents here to watch the Jumbos play, and they've been treated with an opening drive touchdown. Punter Patrick Walsh will be on to kick off. Yeah, let's see how Wesley and... Uh fares on special teams this week. They did have a fumble on a return early last week. However, it was terrible conditions, so I'm going to chalk that one up to maybe just a, a wet ball and slipping out. But Yeah, no rain tonight, so it should be an even playing field as we have our second kickoff of the game coming up. That kick will not make it to the end zone. Returnable, but muffed taken past the 20 yard line, still on his feet and driven to the ground. Strong tackle from Jay Sean Means. And they will take over right around the 20 yard line for their first drive of the game. Strong offense, Wesleyan has coming in. Third in the NESCAC in points per game, third in yards per game. As I said earlier, last week versus Colby, their first game of the season under 400 yards. And again, that was in the rain. So should be an offensive a lot of offensive potential from Wesleyan today. Candido going to hand off to Ezra Jennifer. Cuts left, makes a strong move, and is driven to the ground. Gain of around four on first down. Yeah, Wesleyan kind of uses a, a split head approach here with uh, Tyler Flynn and Ezra Jennifer. They're, they're pretty much neck and neck on carries. Flynn has 56 on the season, and Jennifer has 31. So it'll be worth noting who, who takes the the load of the carries tonight. Tufts coming out early showing cover two man. That's a that's a strong look. Trusting your DBs. Motion from the tight end Luttenberger. Candido drops back. Free rusher in his face. He's gonna be taken down. Might not be a sack. Look like he might have moved forward a little bit. At least no gain on the play, but a strong hold from the Jumbos brings up an early third down. That was an excellent disguised blitz from Tufts. They uh, they showed that he was going to be manned up on the on the slot wide receiver, and instead the linebacker took his uh, took his responsibility and covered his man, and they blitzed the, the nickel corner and uh, successfully got in there and, and forced the pressure and, and the sack. So now Candido with an empty set. Luttenberger in as an extra blocker. He's got four wide receivers split out wide. Under 10 minutes to go. Looks like there might have been some movement. The flag comes out. Will it be a false start? Will it be a neutral zone infraction? We will see. Jumbo's pointing as if it is a false start. Here's the call. It is a false start on the offense. So move back five yards for third down, making it a little more difficult third and eight. Yeah, I think Tufts kind of got bailed out by the false start. Wesleyan, it, it looked like was going to take a shot right there. They had one-on-one -on -one press coverage, and they have two elite wide receivers who will burn you and take you deep. So that, that would have been an interesting play to see. Liam Kennedy lined up at the bottom of your screen. Five receivers out wide on this one. Candido with the hard count. Pressure comes immediately, throws to his left. That ball is caught. Thomas Elkowry with a strong catch on a comeback route for a first down, and the Wesleyan Cardinals move the chains. Yeah, Candido put that ball on a rope, put it right in his face mask, had it when when uh, Elkowry turned around, it was right there in his face, and what a, what a throw. So Tyler Flynn in the backfield now. Chase Wilson with his seven touchdowns on the bottom of your screen. Tyler Flynn motions to Candido's left. It will be a handoff to Flynn. He cuts right, tries to find a lane, but can't really get anything going, and a gain of around no yards on first down. Yeah, that last shot play, though, really put Wesleyan in a good spot, looking at, middle, at midfield now. They got a little bit of a drive going. I like the run play on first down. You, you set up maybe a, another a passing situation right here on second. Flynn remains in the game. Luis Sanchez and Chase Wilson, 
to the left of Candido. This time motions Flynn to his right. Wilson comes in motion. Again, a hard count, looking to get Tufts to jump. Drops back to pass. More pressure comes immediately, and he is brought down and sacked by Shane Reiner, the senior and a longtime leader of this Tufts defense, makes a big play on second down. This pressure is really unusual for Tufts that we're seeing. We, we did not see this the first two or three weeks. I love that they're sending the house at Wesleyan. When you, if you have a good passing offense, you can stop that by getting to the quarterback before he can let, let go of that ball. We've seen multiple blitzes already on this first drive of the game, and they are getting to the quarterback. So this brings up the second third down of the drive. They converted on third and eight. Now third and 15, a little bit more difficult. Candido with a bunch look to his left. This time pocket holds up a little. He steps up, he throws. He's got a man wide open, and it is a first down and a huge hit at the end. Complete to Elkowry. The ball f came out at the end, but it looks like they will be marking him down. So a first down and the chains move again. A big third and 15 conversion to one of his top receivers. Yeah, it looked like a rub route, and they just, Tufts ran man, and when you can do a, a little rub and maybe set a pick on the defender, you can get wide open. Yeah, he made a great move to inch up in the pocket a little bit and found his man at the sticks. A big hit at the end, almost knocked the ball out, but he was down. Clock still ticking under seven minutes to go now. Candido motions Flynn. Defense backs off. This time a handoff to Flynn, but defense swarms immediately. He dives forward, maybe a gain of one or two. Saw Christian Rosario get in on the stop right there. Yeah, that was that same uh, disguised blitz Tufts ran earlier and got the sack on. Victor Garza was out in the slot covering and, and was sent firing in across. The run went away from him, but uh, had that been a pass, he would have been right there in Candido's face. So a lot of shuffling in and out for Wesley and Jared Lindstrom in the game at the far right side of the field. Flynn still in at running back. Candido puts a man in motion that is Lindstrom Sorry, excuse me, the handoff to Jennifer, not Flynn, but strong hold by the defensive line yet again and a gain of around one, so not much going in terms of ground offense early here in the first quarter. Yeah, Tufts D-line and linebackers have been strong so far, really plugging the holes up the middle. Haven't had a lot of success running, and honestly, the, the pass rush has been phenomenal so far. So third and nine. Wesleyan has converted their first two third downs of the game, and they've been a good team on third down so far this year, converting around 43%. Now a third, third and long of the first drive of the game. Again, a bunch look to Candido's left. Takes it straight, drop back, is looking left. He's got a man on the left side. It is caught, but well short of the sticks. Strong tackle from Henry Ferrelli. And that will force, likely, a punt from the Wesleyan offense. I like Tufts getting aggressive there. They sent two linebackers, and they got right in front of uh, Candido's face. I think they pretty much prevented him from being able to see El Cowrie, who was open on a corner route, but uh, forced Candido to check it down underneath. And, and great stop on third down, forcing yeah. a fourth down. Candido had his eyes on the left side of the field. Ricky Eng was the receiver on the catch right there. A junior hasn't had too much action so far this year, but a strong stop by Ferelli and the punt unit is indeed on the field. Andre Smith back to return. That punt is up. It is high. Calling for a fair catch is Smith. He's going to let it bounce behind him. Effort to keep it in bounds, but no dice right there. Bounces out the back of the end zone and a touchback. Well, now looking ahead, if you're the Jumbos, you have a chance to go up 14 early, and you're at home. Uh, this is huge. So if you can drive down and get any sort of points, it puts you up a two-possession game especially against this Wesleyan team that can score. So any lead is crucial. Yeah, and getting that stop on third down was really big. Looked like Wesleyan was having its way in those third and long situations, dialing up the plays they knew they could find some action in, but a strong stop. And now, as, as you said, huge opportunity to go down the field as the Tufts offense returns. Berluti with Reese in the backfield. Jaden Richardson at the bottom of your screen. Two receivers split out wide. Jumbo's looking at adjustments at the line of scrimmage right now, consistently looking maybe to change the play, respond to what this Wesleyan defense is doing. Takes a snap, quickly looks to pass out to his left, caught by Cade Moore, jukes the defender, and drag out of bounds, gain of round seven. Man, I don't know what they saw in the film room this week, but Cade Moore already has five receptions. He is 
a mismatch out there, to say the least. And a team with strong wide receivers against a team with strong cornerbacks, but looks like the advantage goes to Cade Moore so far. Wesley Abraham matched up right now on Richardson. Again, he is your leading interception taker of this season for the NESCAC, but not matched up with the guy who has five catches. Defense creeps up, at least feigning blitz. Ben Carbo up on the line. Berludi looks to pass. Pressure comes immediately. He fires his defender. <laughs> Excuse me. His receiver didn't even know the ball was coming. Got that one out of bounds pretty quickly. Probably the right move to throw that one away. Yeah, it looked like Berludi just was praying that ball would go out of bounds and not into a defender's hand. He had about three white jerseys smothered in his face. Yeah, they came immediately, and nothing Berludi could do about that one. So third and three, under four minutes here in the first quarter. It is really tough as an offensive line when you have linebackers walking up in your face, and then they back off, and then come back in your face, and you really don't know your blitz pickup. That Wesleyan does a great job at doing that. So Luke Botsford starts in the backfield, motions out wide, so an empty set, Berludi alone. With the hard count, he takes a snap, looking left, passes, got Richardson, and a lot of room to run. He's past the 50, he's past the 40, he might be gone. Jaden Richardson has just made this a two-score game early in the first quarter. Touchdown, Jumbos! Oh my goodness. Richardson just absolutely burned the DB on a deep post route and took it to the house. Nobody can touch that guy when he's in space. That's the specialty between Berludi and Richardson is the big play. We talk about it all the time when we watch the Jumbos play. So third and three results in a long touchdown, a slant over the middle of the field. And as soon as Richardson had that, he was absolutely gone. One of the fastest players in the NESCAC, and you saw it right there, outran the entire Wesleyan team. 13-0 Jumbos pending the extra point. What a start. That is a 73-yard touchdown. And funny enough, that's not even his longest on the season. He had an 82-yard touchdown against Trinity week one. Seems like this Tufts team just always has guys they can rely on. Richardson has stepped into a massive role this season. That is his ninth touchdown on the year. He leads the NESCAC, and he's looking to extend that lead and even go for the all-time record at this rate. I mean, I, I'd say he's going to get it. I think the all-time record is 15. Six more at this rate, he's going he's gonna to get there. So that's two straight years with a dominant, dominant Tufts receiver. We saw Phil Lutz last year, and Richardson was no slouch either towards the top of the league in touchdowns, yards per reception, and everything of the like. And now stepping into a number one role, he's really proving his worth. So the Cade moore jaden Richardson combo has really shown up early in this one. And despite the nature of the Wesleyan secondary, which we thought was a strength of their team coming in, the passing offense has had their way early. Berludi, 7 of 10 for 125 yards and two touchdowns. We wanted them to get reestablished, and they've done that. Yeah, and I think, you know, they took that set that Tufts ran, the empty set, they were able to keep Wesley Abrahams off of uh, Jaden Richardson. And that's big. And when you can get their number one corner not matched up on your number one wide receiver, that's a mismatch that Berludi took advantage of there. This is huge for Wesleyan now. You're down 14 to a team that's not going to stop scoring. Walsh, a short kick, returnable, brought in past the 20-yard line and tackled around the 25, so decent starting field position. And you're right, Wesleyan, they have to draw up some of their best plays on this drive. Do not want to give Tufts the ball back with a chance to go up 21-0. Yeah, if you punt the ball away on this drive, you risk the, this game becoming a barn burner and out of reach. It, it might be over before it even started at this point. But as we've said, coming in, Wesley and No Slouch themselves, and they've come into this game second in uh, a lot of second or third in a lot of offensive categories. See if they can show us that on this drive. Candido, a little bit of movement on the Tufts line. Going to be a handoff. Ezra Jennifer breaks a tackle to his left and brought down modest gain, maybe around four. That looked like a, a, a pretty good pickup on first down. That that sets the pace for the drive, and now you have a short, I think it's now second and two, so you really the world is your oyster. You can run the ball, you can pass the ball here. You, you have two more downs to get two yards. Second and two. Candido.
Drops back to pass. Shuffling around in the pocket and sacked, brought down on the play by Victor Garza, the senior from Houston, Texas, and another sack from this Tufts defense, which is suddenly bringing the heat. That was, again, the disguised cornerback blitz from Garza. We mentioned it last drive, how they ran the ball when Garza blitzed. Now they pass the ball, and Garza's right there in his face for the sack. Looked like Candido had decided he wanted to go to uh, his man, Chase Wilson, and, and never really looked anywhere else. Chase Wilson was never open, and, and he had to take the sack. Yeah, I was getting ready for him to uncork one, and he started just shuffling in the pocket and quickly was brought down. Now third and 11, this drive in danger of stalling quickly. Elkari moves in motion. Candido drops back to pass, pressured again. He's got a man deep, but overthrown a little bit. That was to his man, Chase Wilson, and it looks like a three and out for Wesleyan, not what they wanted on this drive. Yeah, a long sack on second and short is uh, just a drive killer. I was talking about how the world is your oyster. You can run the ball, you can pass the ball. You can't take a sack though. That just, you, you can't come back from that. And then you take a shot play on, on third and long and don't connect and now you're giving the ball back to the Jumbos down 14. If they go up 21, I don't know how, with the defense, the Wesleyan defense playing this way, I don't know how they can really get back into this. And Wilson was seemingly open on that route, but the pressure as the snap goes over the punter's head, he's gonna try to fall on it. It's still on the ground. The Jumbos recover on the one yard line and a turnover couldn't get the punt off. Jumbos recover and another swing as this sets up the Jumbos in prime, prime field position to potentially go up 21-0. This is a nightmare for Wesleyan right now. They're their punter looks like he, uh, I, I think there was just a miscommunication on the snap, went way over his head, and special teams issues killed him last week, and it looks like it's killing him this week as well. They really, they just got to, they got to clean things up. This is a front that often gets overlooked, but can lead to huge mistakes like this. No other front of the game can lead to turnovers like that. I mean, you're, you're exactly right. Gage Hammond was the punter on that one. Two straight weeks with just killer special teams mistakes, and anyone who follows football will know you just can't do that. The best teams are the ones who play clean on special teams. We've seen plenty of teams sabotaged by their inability to put together solid special teams play throughout their season. So on the one yard line, Tufts will take over and you have to think an easy opportunity to put this game pretty, pretty out of reach early in the first quarter. A three score lead is hard to overcome. Yeah, you're praying to hold them for a field goal here. You gotta send the house and stop the run early. Look, I, I would assume Tufts is gonna give it to Reese and let him put it in, but you gotta try to stop two straight runs and then maybe a pass look on third down, but this is a tall order. And as I said, coming into today, the Jumbos were 7 of 15 in terms of scoring touchdowns, touchdowns in the red zone. They scored their first opportunity, so they are at 50%, 8 of 16, and a prime opportunity here to add on to that. It will be a handoff to Reese. He dives to the middle, and that is a touchdown. 20 to 0, Jumbos. Reese gets on the board. Mismatch up front, goal line package from Tufts, just plowed ahead. Didn't even get touched going in, so. Reese is 6 foot 2, their offensive line, 6'4, 6'4. 6'1", 6'2", 6'4", all over 250 pounds. There's a lot of big guys up there, and they made it look easy. Yeah, and so far, you know, we've seen Reese have a bounce back game. Cade Moore have a bounce back game. Richardson is just showing what he can do. This Tufts offense is firing on all cylinders, erasing any doubt that may have uh, arose, arisen last week against Bowdoin. Yeah, you really could not ask for a better start if you're Jay Savetti. And now all it's about is holding this lead and potentially adding on to it. And we said coming into today, as the field, uh, extra point excuse me, goes through, we said coming into today, can a team prove that they are worthy of challenging Trinity for the top of the NESCAC? Of course, Tufts has already lost to Trinity, but performances like this, running up that point differential, anything of the sort, is what you really need to do if you want to even have a hope of staying in that title race. So plenty of time for Wesleyan to come back, but they need to make a statement, and they need to make it now. Yeah, it's almost unfortunate Tufts had to play Trinity week one because you'd have to say that this this form of Tufts team would ha fare pretty well against Trinity or at least put up a good fight. And we've seen over the last three years that this Tufts team consistently gets better as the season goes on. Two years ago, they started off 0-4 before going on a winning streak. Having to start this season against Trinity, definitely unfortunate. Still a possibility for that title to come up for grabs, but we'll have to see as Walsh steps up to kick it away. 21 to zero, still in the first quarter. Minute 26 left on the clock. 
Yeah, at this point, at Wes if you're Wesley and you're trying to make it to the halftime without giving any more points up so you can make some adjustments. Again, returnable. Makes a move, cuts past the 25 and driven to the ground. That is their leading receiver, Thomas Elkowry, on the return. So doing a little bit of both. And again, special teams play critical today as the offense comes back. Candido in a position he really has not been in at any point this year, down 21 to zero. And they are going to look to make a statement right away if possible. Despite the scoreboard, I don't want to see Wesleyan go away from what they're comfortable with. It's, it's still the first quarter. You, you can score three touchdowns, no problem. It has happened before. If you're Colorado, it happened <laughs> to you yesterday. That one is a handoff up the middle. Again, not too much going for the Wesleyan offense. More of a passing team than a rushing team. Jennifer only averaging 3.5 yards per carry on the season anyways. Tyler Flynn maybe a little above that, but they've got the two guys who they go to. Flynn in the game currently, but really, in this type of score, you're going to have to start making moves through the air. Yeah, especially in their scoring uh, offense. They only have one rushing touchdown on the year. So really everything comes through their passing offense. Yeah, when they get in the red zone, they anywhere on the field, they pass the ball. Interesting to see if they go to that now. Candido, pressure comes quickly again. He gets that out right to Chase Wilson. Spin move, gain of around three. Yeah, did his best to make uh, something out of nothing there. Four jumbos in his face, had to make a spin move, uh, slipped out of one tackle. But again, that was uh, uh, the, the corner, Victor Garza blitzing, and right in Candido's face, almost deflected the ball. I love to see Tufts switching up their defensive looks. We, we've never seen this blitz package come out of Tufts. Yeah, and making adjustments. Let's see if they can get this man off the field. They do. That was Shane Reiner. Press coverage on the outside. Three receivers to the left of the quarterback. We have a whistle on the field. End of the first quarter, so don't get the playoff there. 21-0, not how we expected this one to start, even among the most optimistic of us. We were in for a good matchup. We still might be, but the Jumbos have made a statement, and it's up to Wesleyan to respond as we exit the first quarter. Still 45 minutes left to play, and we will be right back on JumboCast. So after that quick intermission, we are back here. Start of the second quarter at the Ellis Oval. It will be third and seven to go. Candido and the Wesleyan offense return to the field. He's got stacked wide receivers on both sides of the field. Interesting look with Tyler Flynn in the back field, excuse me. Candido looking to pass on third down. Pressure comes immediately and he is looking to run. Just gets rid of that one. Receiver comes back for it. He had no chance. Crowd calling for intentional grounding. He made a move immediately. That pressure came right away. Nothing he could do. Yeah, great job there of Tufts holding the edge, though, when the quarterback's scrambling. Uh, Candido looked to roll to his left. Jumbo right in his face. Turned back to roll to his, back to his right. Another jumbo in his face. Had to throw it away. And we've seen earlier in this season, Candido has made plays on the run. I think he likes to get out of the pocket if pressure comes. But as you said, Jumbo's kind of closed off both sides of the field and so the punt unit comes back again that's three punts responded to by three touchdowns though one of those punts didn't get off this one does it's a short one bounces not a friendly bounce for Wesleyan and going to be favorable field position for the Jumbo starting right around the 43 yard line yeah this is just a really a special teams nightmare this, so far in the first uh, 15 or so minutes for, for Wesleyan they need to get it together in the halftime break talk to your kicker talk to your punter talk to your long snapper get them on the same page, maybe run through a, f a couple snaps in the locker room, something to get these guys uh, firing again. Yeah, Gage Hammond averaging 38 yards per punt this season. He has a 53-yarder as his longest. That one not even close. Uh, he has eight within the 20, but again, good field position at the 43 for the Jumbos here, so not what they were looking for. This time, 
Berluti with Andre Smith in the backfield has plenty of time to throw, and he's looking deep, throwing in a double coverage. That ball is broken up, but caught for the touchdown. An unbelievable catch off of the deflection. Wow. Jaden Richardson again. Uh, there's nothing you can do there if you're Wesleyan. What are you supposed to do? You have double coverage. It tips off your def defender's hands and nothing nothing else but right back into his hands. I mean, Berluti saw the double coverage. He put it up there, and I can't even explain how that ball came down in the hands of Jaden Richardson, but he's putting together one of the most unbelievable wide receiver seasons we've seen, and that's coming off of a season where we saw one. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that ball should be picked 100 times out of 100, and... Somehow it doesn't. It goes through two guys' hands right into Richardson. I mean, he was smothered. There. I, we both saw double yeah. coverage down the field. Berluti, he what? said, Richardson's down there. I'll throw <laughs> he, it anyways. He's down there somewhere. And it worked out as it seems to every time. 28-0 to zero. Jumbos here. 14 minutes and 41 seconds left in the second quarter. They're on pace for 70 points. Well, if I, you know, I'm all about finding positives. If you're Wesleyan... Uh, positive right now is that there are still three full quarters left. So if Tufts did this in... That could be construed as a negative. Well, there's 15 minutes gone, and Tufts has already put up 28 points. So, you know, you have 45 more minutes. You, you as well could put up 28 points. You would have to hope, but really quite a start for the Jumbo's offense. I don't think any of us expected that, and the parents here at the Ellis Oval are glad to see it at least in the Jumbo student section. So plenty of time left. Could be a good thing for Wesleyan. Could be a bad thing. They really need a strong drive here to at least quiet down this crowd and get whatever momentum they can going as Walsh is back to kick yet again. Continually looking to let that one go. Excuse me. Out the back, the end zone, a touchdown, another short kick from Walsh, but this time a touchback. So 28 to zero, and we're barely at the start of the second quarter. Candido coming out to show why this Wesleyan offense has been so potent so far this season. We haven't seen it yet, but it's a team averaging 25 points per game. And you know, maybe they're a little bit rattled after that loss last week, but gonna need to show something right here. Well, I mean, maybe they're a little bit rattled after watching Tough score 28 unanswered points too. You might be right, but again, maybe a response coming. Empty set on first down, looking to pass. Clearly is Wesleyan, five receivers out wide. Candido throws over the middle, caught, spin move. That's Chase Wilson. Entire jumbo defense comes to bring him down. Gain of around six. I like this start, though. Let's let's start passing the ball more. It's, it's time to abandon the run. You're down 28, you got to throw the ball. Uh, Candido only with... Under about 50 yards so far, and uh, Berluti is already up above, you know, 175. So we we got to start throwing the ball and, and get your confidence up. Forget about the scoreboard. Candido. Corner blitz comes quickly, but it's a handoff. Extra room down past the first down marker, and the chains will move. Yeah, at halftime, I'd like to see the uh, the Wesleyan offensive coordinator sort of dial something up to, to counter this corner blitz. What you can do is you can move your running back towards the side of the of the nickel corner, and you can have him just uh, assigned to pick up that blitz every time. So Flynn remains in the game at running back. Four receivers out wide. Motions Flynn to his left. And a false start, it looks like, <laughs> on the bottom of your screen. Let's see if that's the call. Indeed. That was Thomas Elkowry just started running a route a little bit too early. Yeah, we're just seeing an example of Murphy's Law right now. Anything that could go wrong will go wrong, and they just can't get out of their own way at this point. You had a nice gain, a, a nice two plays to start the drive, and now you're back to first and long. So... Need a, sh a short mid-range pickup right here. On a, a look, look for a pass connection. Man in a slot has a corner 15 yards off the line of scrimmage, but it's a quick pass to his left. Caught by Wilson and absolutely smothered immediately on the play by Victor Garza. And not, a, not another great start to a 
series for Wesley, and it will be second and 15. I don't mind the screen pass call, but when the screen pass gets blown up like that, it just really exploits how how terrible screen passes really can be. It, it reminds me of the Patriots offense, the oh, Bears great. offense. It's just horrific calls on long, on long down distances. And first and 10, you're trying to make a play, but unable to. So second and 14 after it's adjusted. Plenty of time for Candido to throw. He's looking deep down the field. He's got Wilson, and that is caught for a huge pickup. Drop that right in the bucket to his leading receiver, and they will move the chains and then some. So a spark for a Wesleyan offense that desperately needed it. Yeah, dropped it right in the bucket indeed. That was a dime. Uh, that's that's how you get it to your guy, though. you got to just start building some confidence on the on the long ball. Uh, Wesleyan, you know, prolific passing offense, third in the NESCAC. You just – we haven't seen that so far. So now it's, it's good to see that they can exploit this tough defense long. So – on the 16-yard line, Wesleyan has entered the red zone where they are 10 of 16 in terms of touchdowns, 11 of 16 overall on the season. Two men in the backfield, two receivers to his right. It's a handoff to Flynn. Slim pickings yet again, but a solid gain. Maybe around four or five, hard to tell. Yeah, and this is where one of our keys of the game for Tufts is, is to make a stop in the red zone. They are 12 for 12. Uh, opponents are 12 for 12 against Tufts with – Nine touchdowns and three field goals. A field goal really does not hurt you if you're the Jumbos. But Looked to me like he gained some yards. Apparently not. Uh, there we go. Changed second and seven it will be. So a gain of three yards on first down. 13-yard line. Candido with three receivers to his right. Sends a man out in motion. He's looking to that man. It is Jennifer caught. Breaks a tackle. Breaks another tackle and drives out of bounds at around the two yard line. So we'll be close to a first, if not a first down indeed. Chains are moving, so it will be first and goal on a swing pass to his running back, Ezra Jennifer. Yeah, good uh, good on Candido there, going through his progressions. Everything was blanketed in terms of wide receivers and then checked down to his running back for a nice pickup in the first down. That's a safe play. Now I'd like to see them really just hammer it in with the run. Yeah, as we said, they only have one rushing touchdown on the year. Only one, that was in the red zone. First and goal to go on the four-yard line, but they're yeah. throwing. Fakes, cuts upfield, tries to reach for the goal line. That ball came out at the end, but he will be down at the one. No score, so they look to pass and can't get it done. I would not be shocked to see them go back to the same look. They like to get their number one wide receiver on an island, which is just one-on-one -on -one coverage out there with no, no help over top. They like to run the fade route because they trust their guy to beat their DBs. So... Uh, you know, here you can see it again, the same set just flipped to the other side. I, I personally would like to see them run the ball in, though. That's, yeah. that's a safe play. Jennifer is 6'2", 220. He's a grad student. He's been on this team. He motions to his right, but they have an opportunity right here. Motions back to his left. This time, Candido will not hand it off. It's a fake. He dives forward, and that is a touchdown for the Wesleyan Cardinals. They get on the board after a rough start, and... Potentially with an extra point, bring the gap to 28 to 7. And that drive only took four minutes off the clock. There's still 10 minutes left in the second quarter. If you can make a stop and get the ball back and maybe go into halftime down 14, you're not looking in the worst shape. So the 50 yard completion to Chase Wilson sets up the rushing touchdown from Candido, his first rushing touchdown on the season. Daniel Yoon on to kick. And the Tufts red zone defense drought continues. It does. They have yet to record a stop in the red zone this season. That is an unbelievable stat. We said coming into this game, it was something they needed to change. Haven't been able to do that so far. Well, I guess if you're going to go up 28-0 to zero to start, though, you don't need to make a ton of red zone stops. But that's uh, a key trait of really good football teams is red zone defense. If you can make turnovers in the red zone, cause them to kick field goals mostly, not touchdowns. Yeah, a disconcerting trend. Absolutely. So that makes, I think, opponents 13 of 13 in the red zone against the Jumbo so far, and quite a lot of those are touchdowns. Yeah, 10 of them, to be exact. That's not really a sustainable uh, number. However, if their offense keeps playing like this, you can take the pressure off your defense. So now momentum at least evens out a little bit. Wesleyan with the touchdown. Jumbos with two men back received certainly want to score again, see if they can find Jaden Richardson for another touchdown, but we will see. Ten minutes to go here in the second quarter. Plenty of time. Kickoff 
is called for a fair catch by Andre Smith, and the Jumbos will take over. I'd like to see Tufts keep their foot on the gas. You saw them up 21-0 on the last drive, taking a deep shot play to open the drive. I'd like to see them do the same thing. Don't take away the deep ball just because you're up by 21. Keep sticking to your game plan as if it was 0-0. You know, maybe you can mix in a few more runs with Reese, uh, a few more design runs with Berluti, but get the ball to your, to your guys, Richardson and Cade Moore. But you're looking first down, and Andre Smith is in the backfield, primarily a receiving running back more so than someone who gets the ball on the ground. C.J. Burton in the slot. Yeah, would not be surprised to see them get a little screen pass or a dump off to, to uh, Moore. So Berluti, it is a pass, looks to his right, changes his mind, is rushing left, keeping his eyes upfield to the sideline, and he will just run out of bounds, maybe a loss on the play. Didn't see anything and just tucked it and ran. Yeah, he maybe could have fit one in on the Cade Moore. He kind of sat down and came back and found a hole in the zone, but safer play, just run out of bounds, effectively you know, a one-yard gain. It's almost like throwing the ball away. Yeah, so as you said, they'll give him a gain of one, better than throwing the ball away. Richardson now at the bottom of your screen. Empty set look as a huge shift comes in for Wesleyan. Entire defensive line change, not something you see frequently. They have a lot of guys. They like to rotate in and out. Press coverage on the outside, Berluti, he's looking that way. He's got Cade Moore, cuts up field, dives forward, and he's got a first down. Yeah, I'm not sure the game plan by Wesley, and they had their safety on the number three wide receiver, which was Cade Moore, and their safety's manned up, but he's 15 yards off the ball. Cade Moore obviously was going to beat this guy on a five-yard out. Berluti ID'd that pre-snap and, you know, didn't take his head off Cade Moore the entire time. And he had plenty of options on that play as well. Moore came wide open underneath. He had options over the top if he wanted to take a shot, so Jumbo's really making it work in every sense of the word so far today. Again, empty set. They are looking to continue passing the ball. Robbie Moret now in the game at wide receiver. Berluti, two-step drop, throws left, and caught by Cade Moore, breaks a tackle. He's got plenty of room and brought down at around the 43-yard line. They are finding that man. He had zero receptions last week and a lot more than zero this week. I mean, here's the jumbos we knew from last year, running the same play twice in a row because you had success on the first time. Why not flip it and run the same play the other way? Wesleyan came out in the exact same coverage. They had their linebacker on Cade Moore. That's a mismatch. Throw it to him right away. And Cade Moore's looking great after the catch so far today. Berluti again comes out with no running back in the backfield. So first and 10 from the 43, they're looking to pass. Burton and Richardson to his left. Three wide receivers to his right. Berluti. Eyeing, going to throw right, and it is going to be called a catch on the right side of the field by Robbie Moret. The senior comes in the game and makes a contested catch on the sideline. That was a heck of a catch. Two hands above his head, diving out of bounds. Got a foot down, and I mean, only a three yard, two, three yard gain, but style points for sure. Yeah, that was a bit far from our angle. Couldn't tell if he got that foot in bounds. Referees say he did. That's Moret. He will remain on the field now all the way to Berluti's left. This time a running back is in the game. Berluti making calls at the line. Second and eight. It is a handoff. And he breaks a tackle. Andre Smith breaks another tackle. Spin move and down past the 20 yard line. So the return man, Andre Smith, comes in the game and makes an impact right off the bat. I mean, we were just saying he's usually a pass catcher, but uh, I tell you what, that, that open field speed, once he gets in the second level, is really hard to bring down. That's why they give him the ball. So Jumbo's working it at all three levels of the field. They're running it, they're passing it. Intermediate, short, long, doesn't matter. Now, ball on the 20-yard line. Jumbo's in the red zone. They've had success there so far today, showing no signs of letting off the gas pedal. Smith remains in the backfield. Berluti will fake it to him and throw to Richardson, but that ball is broken up on the left sideline. Hit him in his hands, but strong defense from Wesley Abraham to prevent a completion. Yeah, finally a tip drill goes Wesleyan's way and the ball hits the turf, you know, and the last tip drill <laughs> fell into Richardson's hands for a, a deep bomb touchdown. But one of these balls needs to be caught by Wesleyan and taken the other way. They need to force some turnovers. So finally, Chartelis Reese re-enters the game. I think his first snap on this drive, they've been doing pretty good without him, but a big bruising running back to help them in the red zone. 
I mean, they've only had one designed run on this drive so far, and that was the long one to Andre Smith. Don't be, uh, excuse me, as the handoff goes to Reese. He cuts right. He's got plenty of room, puts his head down, and makes it to the five-yard line. Excuse me, I thought they might be looking to pass right there, but quick handoff to Reese, and they set themselves up with first and goal under seven minutes to go. Lineman came up a little bit limp on that one. That's Jack Lynch. He'll come off the field, a, a big body on that offensive line, not someone you want to see come down with an injury. Yeah, he just threw his helmet on the sideline. He does not look too happy. Now Berludi. He's got Richardson one-on-one -on -one with Wesley Abraham to his left. But it is a handoff to Chartelis Reese. Cuts right, puts his head down, and scores another touchdown for the Jumbos. Second of the day from Reese. It's just this offense is looking unstoppable. Wesleyan really hasn't had a negative, uh, been able to force a negative play. No tackles for loss, no sacks. They just can't get into the backfield to make stops up front. So potentially 35 points on the board for the Jumbos, and there's still six and a half minutes left in the second quarter. Really an unbelievable offensive showing. Reese's second touchdown of the day, showing his value in the red zone. And Wesleyan will again have to respond. At some point, they're going to need to stop if they want to get back in this game. Yeah, great point there. I was going to say, your offense just went down and scored for you. Now you need to make a stop. You need to help your offense out and make stops. Uh, the offense is going to start to get frustrated with the defense really soon. Letting up 35 points is, is never a good recipe for success. Extra point is good. I mean, coming into this game, they were sixth in points per game allowed at 20.5. Jumbo's not much better at 20 flat. They were fifth and sixth in the league, respect, respectively. Uh, second in rush yards per game allowed. Third in pass yards per game allowed. But that has not been the case so far. And they have been sliced up by the Jumbo offense. Candida will come back on the field knowing they scored on the last drive, but defense didn't help. Yeah, it's worth noting, though, that this Tufts defense is the number one passing defense in the league, allowing the least yards per game. And that's kind of Wesleyan's M.O. They want to pass the ball. They want to be able to throw for 300 yards. Candido's done it, I think, twice already this season. So that's really something that's not possible against the Jumbos, or at least hasn't been so far. He had five passing touchdowns in a game this season. Again, as you said, 300 yards several times. 50-yard completion to Chase Wilson on the last drive. They've shown the ability to move it, just have to do it more consistently. Walsh kicks off. This one will again be well short of the end zone. This one's returned past the 20, past the 25, and a flag comes flying in as he is driven out of bounds at around the 28. That was Ricky Eng on the return. Not sure what the flag's going to be for. I don't know if it's a block in the back, but I, I missed it. We'll see about the call. will be a hold on Austin Baker, the freshman linebacker, and that will move the start of this Wesleyan drive back just a bit. Well, after getting gashed kind of last drive, for the first time we saw this tough defense with some holes. You know, they let up the long ball, as you said, the 50-yard completion to uh, Chase Wilson. But outside of that, they looked pretty stout, as you know, per usual. Candido back with Tyler Flynn in the backfield. Another false start, it looks like. I think that was Elk Aury yet again. Second time today he has started running a route before the snap. I'm not sure what's going on over there. Usually as a wide receiver, you, you start with, you look in, you watch the ball, you look at your center, you, you see when the center moves his hand. But it looks like he's just eyeing up the DB and, and going based off the DB's movement, which makes no sense to me. He really wants to beat that defender, it looks like, but setting this drive back yet again. So two penalties before a snap even occurs. Same personnel. It is a handoff to Flynn. He has plenty of room, and he will drive to the ground right about where the first down marker would have been had there not been a false start. So second and 10 after a first and 15. Yeah, good run play to get back on the schedule. Now you have second and 10. It's most likely a passing down as, as you want to complete at least like a six or seven yard completion here so you can set up uh, your entire playbook on third down. Candido surveying. Plenty of time in the pocket. He rolls, cuts back. 
Keeps his eyes downfield and throws that one. It is caught. An unbelievable catch right around the first down marker. Let's see the call. And they... No signal. They're saying Incomplete. So excuse us on that one. Looked like a catch from our angle, but they rule it out of bounds. That was the junior, Devin Hardy. Big, big target at six foot four. He showed it there. Looks like he just couldn't get that foot in bounds real close, if you ask me. But it will be third and ten. Yeah, it would have been a heck of a catch, too. Put his body on the line. Good job by Candido extending the play, though, rolling around in the pocket. So four receivers split out on third and ten. Candido looking to pass. Pressure comes immediately. He dumps that one off. Couldn't get it to his receiver. Looked like he couldn't make up his mind between running or throwing a little dump off. And it will be incomplete in fourth and ten. Looked like they were trying to set up a screen pass on third and long. They had a wide receiver screen on the right side. Looked like a little running back dump off on the left. Just uh, kind of a mess out there. Everyone running every which way. And now you're forced to punt it back to the Jumbos who have already scored 35 points on your defense. Looking to make it 42, and it's just not looking great. Can't imagine that was the plan on third down. Pressure might have made a difference. So this one gets off to Smith. He returns and has a fair catch right in front of the 50-yard line. We will go to the sideline for a quick report from Justin. Jumbos are up big tonight in no small part due to the rushing efforts of Chartellis Reese. So far on just five rushes, 33 yards and two touchdowns. I'm looking for Chartellis Reese to be used in a big way as the Jumbos look to drain this clock in the second half and secure this win, moving to four, potentially a four and one and a, and a two-way tie or three-way tie for first in the NESCAC. Back to you, Jared and Henry. Yeah, thank you. Chartellis Reese definitely showing a little bounce back from a somewhat disappointing showing last weekend. If the Jumbos want to drain the clock, great idea to keep it going on the ground as they come back out first and 10 from the 48-yard line. It is Reese who gets the ball on first down, makes a jump cut, but swarmed immediately and driven to the ground for a loss of around two. You know, I understand them, you know, maybe the idea of draining out the clock, but I'd like to see him keep the foot on the gas pedal. Point differential does matter in the NESCAC in terms of standings. And as well, you know, this is still the first half of the game. You don't take the foot off the gas yet. You, you don't take the foot off the gas ever. So these shot plays have really been what Tufts has been successful on so far today. The, the long ball, two to Richardson already. So I'd like to see him keep going. Cade Moore clearly has a mismatch on this Wesleyan defense as well. Yeah, hard to guard both of those guys at once, and you would think they want to look back to it. Seems like they might here on second and 12. No running back in the backfield. Five receivers split out wide. Berluti immediately looks to pass. He's got his eyes downfield. That ball is tipped and almost intercepted in the middle of the field. That was Jack Nally, the senior defensive back, who almost came away with, a uh, with an interception right there. Couldn't tell if it was tipped on the line, but... Not a great throw from Berluti on second and 12. Yeah, Berluti's usually a pretty safe passer, only two interceptions so far on the season. Wesleyan really needs to come up with one, though. So an opportunity missed as the ball fell out of Natalie's hands. Now third and 12 from the 50-yard line. There's a pass. Berluti steps up, he's gonna look to run. He's got room, cuts left, and dives to the ground. Saw the man coming, and brings up fourth down. So the first time today that the Tufts offense has failed to score a touchdown. Yeah, good job just getting down and, and not getting yourself hurt in, in a game that's getting out of reach here. Four verticals concept on third and long, pretty standard. Nothing was there. Wesleyan did a great job covering over top and not letting anybody get, get behind them. Um, good, I mean, this is the first time we've seen them stop Tufts offense, so. We'll see how they can respond after coming after the punt. Maybe an adjustment from the Wesleyan defense. Patrick Walsh will be on to punt it away. He's got four punts within the 20-yard line so far this season. Looks to place another one. Gets this one off. It is long and high. It will bounce within the 10, but bounce out the back of the end zone for a touchback. So Wesleyan a chance to get back on the board. Three minutes and 35 seconds left to go here in the first half. And hopefully, if you're Wesleyan, score, 
get the ball back at the end of the at the start of the first half, second half, excuse me, and score again. Yeah, you got to score on this drive. 335 remaining. Probably a pass heavy uh, pass heavy drive coming, but uh, look for the connection from Candido to Chase Wilson again. They they were successful in deep ball. You need a little deep ball to jump start this drive. Wesleyan offense back on the field. Candido throwing on first down, bootleg rolls out. Plenty of time, but he's sacked on the play. A huge tackle. Bringing him down was who else but Ed Uteri, the longtime stalwart on the Tufts defense. Sniffed that one out immediately. Not sure if it was a designed bootleg, but he got there quickly. He moves fast for a man that's 260 pounds and sets the Wesleyan offense back quickly on this drive, second and 14 to go. Five sacks last week, already four this week in the first half. This is a new look for the Jumbos. They never usually send this much pressure up front or have this much success getting in with their four-man front. So defensive coordinator Justin Manning been cooking up a lot the last two weeks. Pressure comes again. Candido's going to look to run, keeps his eyes upfield, and is tackled by two men after a gain of a couple yards. Will set up third and long, and he's looking downfield, and there's nothing there. I don't know, though. That's that's one of those. He had a pretty clean pocket once he had stepped up. He decided to tuck it and run pretty soon. Um, I'd like to see him reset and, and check downfield again. I think he could have had a, a, a longer connection, but alas, he'll take a, a three- or four-yard run. So Shane Reiner gets in on the stop, and a timeout is called with two minutes and 36 seconds left to go in the first half. 35-7 to seven is our score. Third and 10 here, if you can't convert, Jumbos will gladly take an opportunity to score another one and maybe get 40 points before the half. So a big third down coming up for Wesleyan. Last third and 10, pretty much in the same exact position. We saw them run a, a pretty discombobulated screen pass, to say the least. So I'd, I'd like to see them move away from that concept and into something a little bit more traditional or successful. There's been a little bit of good, a little bit of bad for Wesleyan on third down so far. Had some completions early and a 50-yarder to Chase Wilson at one point. But as you said, the last third down ended in a not very pretty play. So third and 10 on the 20, attempting to prevent the Jumbos from getting the ball back yet again will be Candido. Elk Aury, the bottom of the screen. Ezra Jennifer in the backfield. Yeah, they're only two for six on third down so far. So need to get those numbers up to, keep, to stay competitive. Four jumbos on the line. Candido looking to pass. Pressure in the pocket, but he wisely steps up, fires over the middle of the field. A lot of contact, but incomplete. And they will look to punt. Ty Richardson, the freshman in on a defensive stop. Looking for Lindstrom, Candido was. Couldn't fit it in there over the middle. And the punt unit comes onto the field. Yeah, Jeremy Zuniga might have got away with uh, one right there. Looks like looks like he was pulling on the on the back of the receiver. Kind of came over top a little early, but uh, nothing's really going Wesleyan's way. And this is a, you know, one might say home field advantage. Punt just gets off, and that one's going to be a short one yet again. Bounces at around the 40, but takes a huge bounce for Wesleyan. See where they mark this one. Looked like it could have been another disaster, but it'll be right around the 40-yard line. Not great field position, but could have been a lot worse. Yeah, didn't get a, uh, didn't really get a spiral on that punt. Uh, Gage Hammond has really been struggling all night. I don't know the connection between him and the long snapper. Seemed to be a little. There seems to be some miscommunications, to say the least. So, and he had, you know, two jumbos right in his face getting that off. It's a tough punt to make, backed in your own 10. Two and a half minutes, roughly, to go. Plenty of time for the jumbos to get back on the board. See what they dial up here with four men split out wide, including a receiver, Botsford, who he's looking at down the left side of the field on a wheel route. He's got him open, and that is caught. Did he get a foot inbound? He did. An unbelievable throw and an even better catch from Luke Botsford, the senior wide receiver, and Berluti dials up another one. 
Yeah, that's a track runner right there. Coming out of the backfield, running a wheel route, you have to have immense speed to beat a, uh, a defensive back coming out of the backfield. He already has a five, six yard advantage on you. He burned him, got on the sideline. Berluti looked his way the whole time, really just sat back in his drop and, and dropped it in the bucket. And to track that ball is no small feat. I cannot do that. <laughs> we played flag football yesterday and I demonstrated that several times, but Luke Botsford, unbelievable catch and sets up the jumbos in the red zone yet again. Ball on the 20 yard line, first and 10, under two minutes now. Reese back in the game in the backfield. It will be a handoff to him, excuse me. Play action, over the middle, caught, touchdown, Cade Moore. This safety on Cade Moore matchup is just not working. Simply put, he's exposing the defense. They keep manning him up with the safety. I don't know what they're doing. And he fooled me on the play fake right here. Looked like a handoff to Reese, sold it incredibly well. See the defenders, the linebacker come down, leaves Cade Moore wide open over the middle field. Accurate pass and a touchdown. 41 points pending that extra point in the first half alone. We will have to check if that's a record, but I have to imagine it might be. Yeah, we really just haven't seen Tufts even score this many points in a full game, let alone the first half. But uh, Von Selig with a chance to put him up to 42, and he does. Just an unbelievable offensive performance. Not many words we can say that we haven't said already. Just Every player has come to contribute so far today. Berluti now 13 for 18, 274 yards, four touchdowns, averaging well over 10 yards per completion. Richardson, three receptions, 140 yards, two touchdowns. Cade Moore, eight receptions, 93 yards, two touchdowns. Chartelis Reese, six carries, 33 yards, two touchdowns. That is three guys with two touchdowns. That's six touchdowns and just... Historic offensive performance so far. Wesleyan is not in a good spot. Yeah, to say they have no answer would be an understatement at this point. It's it, something is going to have to happen at halftime. I don't know if a whole new defense is going to come out. I don't know if you, your your secondary, your second team gets you a better look. Something has to switch up. They just have not been able to stop. Like you just said, three guys have two touchdowns. That just does not happen. Cannot happen. Does it happen in one half? Right. This this if you looked at the box score right now, you would think, oh, that's the, the game's over. It's just been quite the performance, but still time left in the first half as this kick is returned and brought down to around the 25-yard line. Need some consolation points if you're Wesleyan right now. Anything to get back in this one. Maybe it's out of reach, but you have a minute and a half here because Tufts only took less than a minute to score. You should get the ball at the half. Jumbos are pointing as if the ball came out and they recovered it on that, re on that kickoff, excuse me, but... Wesleyan offense is on the field. Forward progress was stopped before the ball came out, came out at the very end of that play. But as I said, minute 30 here to go. You have a, you have time to score and you get the ball back at the start of the second half. So, you know, if you play it right, it could be 42 to 21, which is better than 42 to seven. Yeah, the real problem is Wesleyan keeps starting drives to their own 20 and going nowhere and then punting the ball to their own, to the 50. So Tufts only has to go half field every single time to score. Whereas Wesleyan, again, is now looking at a 75-yard field to even touch the end zone. And Tuff still has two timeouts. If you're Wesleyan, you cannot give them the ball back before the end of the half. Got to get something on offense right here. It is a pass play. Candido is going to look to run. He's got a ton of room to his left. Pass the first down marker slides at around the 38-yard line. So at least getting the ball up the field a little bit. They're going to rush back to the line. Do have all three, time, three timeouts remaining. Yeah, and college rules when you get a first down, the clock does stop. So if you're going to take off and run like that, way to get the first down and then slide right after it. Good uh, good field awareness by Candido. So clock under minute 20. Candido wanna, wants to make another play. It is a pass. Pressure comes quickly. He steps up in the pocket. Plenty of time. Fires over the middle directly at a tough defender. That is Ty Richardson. He could not bring it in. Not a good throw from Candido. Not at all. I'm not really sure what he was looking at. Maybe it came out of his hand a little weird. Clean pocket, though. Looks Me like Ty Richardson kind of just jumped the route and was sitting right in front of it the whole time. So lucky to avoid an interception on first down. We'll bring up second down, though. The clock does stop. One minute and eight seconds remaining in the first half. Would not be surprised to see Candido favor on the left side here, the one-on-one -on, -one on an island. He is looking to pass, moves up in the pocket. Flag comes out, might be a hold on the offense. He's going to run, gain of around maybe three. 
Candino's been moving a lot in the pocket right there. Pressure may have resulted in a penalty. We'll see what the call is. He is 8 of 14 on the day for 105 yards. Could be a lot worse. We'll wait for the call. Excuse me, not a hold on the offense. It will be a hands to the face penalty on the defense and that will move Wesleyan up yet again. So first and 10 with a minute left to go and suddenly they are in jumbo territory. Yeah, finally something going Wesleyan's way. They can score on this drive and bring it back to uh, a 28 point game. They have a better chance in the second half. Especially getting the ball at the start of the second yep. half. So could quickly become a 21 point game with two consecutive scores. Justin Manning wants to prevent that from happening for the Tufts defense. Press coverage on the outside. Wilson comes in motion. Another pass play, long drop back. Always moving is Candido, but he will be brought down for the sack. Multiple defenders in on that one, including Shane Reiner at the end. Great edge it, rush, and then steps right up into the pocket, forcing the sack. You know who was in on that sack? Suleiman Abu Akel gets another one on the board. Hits his fourth sack in two weeks after that one. The clock is continuing to run. Big stop on first down. And it really looks like Candido's got a case of happy feet in the pocket right now. He might be moving a little too much. Walked into that one. 30 seconds left on the clock. Wesleyan not using their timeout. Candido, again looking to pass. Pressure comes immediately. He's rolling to his right. He's going to step up and fire. He was close to the line of scrimmage. The flag comes out, and that ball is over the heads of everyone in the end zone. A flag does come in at the end towards the line of scrimmage, however. Yeah. And they are letting that clock run. 18 seconds now. Clock is stopped on the incompletion, but odd that no timeout has been used by this Wesleyan offense. Yeah, you have all three timeouts. I'm not really, I don't understand why you let the clock run like another 20 seconds when that's almost two plays you could get off. Call coming in. Candido moved up pretty close to the line of scrimmage when he let that one off. Looked like he had at least one part of his body behind it, which is the rule. Two flags came flying in. Referee consulting with coaches on the sideline. And I think if he had thrown a little bit better of a ball on the on the deep play there, they might have got got a pass interference call. Looked like there was a lot of contact down there, but the ball was just uncatchable. So yeah, closer to a Tufts defender or anyone else. Yeah. So Coach Savetti has made a decision on the penalty. Two fouls on the offense. Wow. So, two penalties on the play, a 10-yard penalty for holding and a 15-yard penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct on wide receiver Thomas Elkowry, so a 25-yard penalty for Wesleyan will all but end their chance of scoring here at the end of the first half. I did not catch what might have caused that unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, but it's not something you want at any point in the game, let alone when you have somewhat of a chance to get on the board. So a unfathomable 25-yard uh, penalty for Wesleyan. And Elkowry now has 25 yards, a, a penalty alone on himself. He had the two false starts and now a personal foul. He's just really costing the offense right now. And we, th we thought they could really establish a drive, but now it looks like it's second and 40. Unsurprisingly, he is not on the field for this play. Um, excuse me, four wide receivers in the game, one in the backfield. It is a handoff and plenty of room for Flynn to go. That ball comes out at the end and it is recovered by the Jumbos. A fumble. Indeed, it is a fumble, and the Jumbos will take over yet again. They have a chance. Nine seconds left here in the first half. Every time Wesleyan gets the ball, you know, you and I sort of talk about surely it couldn't get worse. And uh, every time it gets worse. A fumble after on second and 40, you, you just can't. I mean, I don't even know what's in your playbook for second and 40. You don't have anything drawn up for those. So I, I understand the run. You hopefully let, then let the clock run out and get to the half. But no luck there. And now Tufts is going to come out. And I think they could take a quick shot, a, a, a quick quick out, and then get Von Selick out on the field for a, a a deep field goal. So Flynn fumbles, looked like Victor Garza on the recovery. 
and a timeout as they will look to think over it. Flynn was the one with the ball who fumbled and just 25 yard penalty into a fumble is not what you're looking for if you are Wesleyan. You think the Jumbos dial up a shot play here? You, if you're Wesleyan, you know what they're gonna do. Can't really put the ball on the ground. You do have a timeout remaining, I believe. I don't mind a run here because I think Wesleyan might be playing so far off the ball, just protecting, guarding the deep ball that you might be able to pick up five, seven yards and then call timeout right away and, and give Von Selig the, the chance to put one through the uprights. Yeah, at the 38-yard line right now, probably a bit out of Seelitz's range. Would have to move up a bit to give him a chance. But if you're up 42-7, to seven, really no reason not to take a shot. Three points is, is chump change when you're up more than 30. Yeah, I agree. But, again, it's just you, you, you move the deficit even more, maybe increase your first-half scoring record even more and, and milk the game away. So Berluti now is looking to pass. It might be a shot down the field. It is to the right side. That ball will be broken up, incomplete. No flags come in, so two seconds remain. They'll get at least one more shot to the end zone unless they want to send the field goal unit out there. It was to Henry Fleckner on the right side, but broken up, incomplete. Yeah, looking for a little Hail Mary, four verticals, maybe throw it up into a bunch set and see if you know your star. Oh. Looks like they're going to kneel it out, show some good sportsmanship, and bring it into the half. It is kneeled down by Berluti. That will take us to the end of the first half here at the Ellis Oval. It has been an offensive display for the Jumbos. 42-7 to at the end of the first half. An absolute rout so far. We've seen big games from Berluti, Cade Moore, Jaden Richardson, Sharatelis Reese, and all of the above. The defense has stood, stood strong and we will be going to the half with an unbelievable advantage in favor of the Jumbos. We will be back with the Jumbo Zone in a couple minutes, and we will be back again with more action in the second half.
Well, it's been a quick start for the Jumbos here on Parents Weekend on Ellis Oval. Jumbos already lead 42 to seven in what can be called the Richardson Rampage. Two quarters down and two to go, and we are here to break it all down. Hello and welcome back to the Jumbo Zone. Thank you so much to Jared Cohen and Henry Burns to breaking down the game so far. I'm Felix Bhattacharya, joined here by my good friend, Justin Loker. Well, Justin, it's been quite a game so far, which can quite frankly be called the Richardson Rampage. Why is that, my man? Well, great to be here. Glad to be on Jumbo Cast in front of the camera tonight. The, the, the scoring all started in the first quarter with Cade Moore, but the real explosive highlights were definitely from Jaden Richardson. Two touchdowns, 140 yards on only three receptions. He's been the reason that the Jumbos went up. He was the reason the Jumbos went up big early. Yeah, I mean, you've seen explosive plays from him so far. He's a true danger out there on the field, right? Absolutely. I was talking to Riley. He said that he had 4-3 speed out there. I compared him to the speed of a cheetah. He, no one could catch him when he got loose from the defense. No way, no way anyone can get him loose. But he's not the only star from the Jumbos so far on the field. Cade Moore and another explosive player that we've seen so far. Talk to him about, about his plays so far. Well, absolutely. Cade Moore has been the reliable target for Berluti tonight. Berluti having connected with Moore eight times tonight for 93 yards and another two touchdowns. Never can have enough touchdowns with this offense. He just added on. What can I say? He's been there when Berluti needed him. Well, you know that they call the game of football. You can't really win it by offense. It's really a defensive game. Talk about the Jumbo's defense and the impact that they've been having as well. Well, we got that too. The Tufts defense tonight, four sacks and two fumble recoveries, including a fumble recovery right at the two yard line of the Wesleyan Cardinals, setting up the first of two Chartellis Reese touchdowns tonight. I mean, I don't know about you, Justin, but but we've been having a great time out here right by Ellis Oval. There was that one explosive play where my jaw literally dropped. Well, my voice is still a bit a bit cracked from screaming after that touchdown. That was such a great touchdown walk, to watch. Walk us through that play once more. So it was just a long, well, the play it was, it was a long pass towards the right corner of the end zone. It looked like it was about to be intercepted, but then it bounced off the defender's chest, hands, face mask, and Richardson was able to just catch it over his back shoulder and just stroll into the end zone, putting these jumbos up even further. And I mean, you talk about the defense being a powerhouse here for the jumbos so far. You know, they've, they've barely let any yards go by. If you look at those two receivers, Richardson and Moore, they've actually outrun the entire Wesleyan offense so far. Well, well, the defense has just been good. They've been good, disciplined, just stopping the run, not letting get anything get outside them or behind them. We'll see how much, we'll see uh, how low the offense, or we'll see how good their defense is in the second half. We'll see what uh, what Wesleyan can do to respond. I mean, it's a deep score, but what can Wesleyan do to get back in this ball game? It really just starts with limiting the mistakes, getting better in the trenches, and getting a pass rush, not letting the Tufts defense get to the quarterback. Well, it wouldn't be a NESCAC football game without looking at the rest of the NESCAC. Justin, break down what's been going on on this phenomenal Saturday so far. Well, it looks like Col looks like Colby. Well, yeah, you have you have Colby beating Amherst today, 19 to 16. But I think the shocker of the day has to be Trinity. Talk about how Trinity beat Middlebury and the impacts that that's going to have on that that scoreboard and around the NESCAP. Well, Trinity's loss to Middlebury today means that with the win tonight. Should the Jumbos could move into a three-way tie for first place in the NESCAC. It would probably take another loss from it would take another loss from Trinity and likely a Jumbo win over Middlebury later this year if Tufts has if Tufts wants to claim the NESCAC title outright. But after tonight, they're gonna be four and one and on a four-game win streak. And with that, that Trinity Trinity loss today, you know, it really brings these two teams, the Wesleyan Cardinals and the Tufts Jumbos, those two three and one teams, the, the team that wins here tonight. They're back in that contention for first place. Oh yeah, Wesleyan's not a bad team at all. They're three and one. The Jumbos have just been on a roll these last four weeks. They've basically played flawless football. Well, we have two more quarters to go in this football game. It's definitely a lot of time left here for the Cardinals to come back or for plenty more Tufts Jumbos touchdowns to occur. 
In a few moments, we got an interview with Star Center from the Tufts Jumbos, Bobby Stewart. I'm happy to have him join uh, by, uh, by me here at this desk very soon. Justin, it's, it's been a pleasure, man. It's been, a great, it's been a great time watching this game with you. We look forward to that interview. We look forward to more second half highlights here on JumboCast. We'll be back in a second. Welcome back here on the Jumbo Zone. It's, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome Star Tufts basketball player Bobby Stewart to the show. Bobby, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Enjoying man. the game awesome. so far? Dude, I mean, you can't ask for much more. 42 to 7. Great start for the Jumbos. What, what was that one moment that really stood out to you in this first half? I mean, it's got to be that, that Jaden Richardson touchdown. That catch was just unbelievable. We were sitting up in the stands, me and some of my teammates, like, he caught that? Like, that, that dude's unbelievable. And Cade Moore, too, and Berluti. It's just the offense is it's beautiful. 42 points. It's awesome. I mean, it's crazy how he's just juggling the ball up in the air, caught it, ran into it. Unreal. The end Unreal. Zone. Phenomenal. Well, you guys have a, have a big season coming up soon. How have these past two years been and preparing you for now being an upperclassman and being one of those leaders? I mean, yeah, it's unbelievable. The time has really flown, like, getting here, being a junior now. But I'm, I'm really pumped up for this season. We got a great group of guys. We got some new, uh, new coaches on the coaching staff. We've got returners. The freshmen are great. It's we're, uh, we're really excited for this upcoming year. Next week, we got our first practice going on. And yeah, man, I'm really excited. I think it's going to be a good year. I'm excited for the jumbo, jumbo basketball season. You have a, a game that you're looking forward to the most? Oh, man. I mean, I think it's got to be Hamilton. They got us in, uh, in the NESCAC playoffs last year. So just we, we got we to gotta get them back, show them what's up, show them what the jumbos are all about. Well, here at Tufts campus, it's, it's parents weekend this weekend. Uh, Talk to me about the impact that your folks really had, not only as you, as a, as a player, as a person, and, and, you know, how's that experience been? I mean, wh what role did they have in your development? Oh, it's great. I mean, I'm going to give a massive shout-out to my mom here. She's been – it's been me and her for as long as I can remember. She's coming every single game. She's, like – she's more upset than me if she misses a game. She's at every single one of them, always in the stands. I'm always looking for her, making sure she's there, so – it's great to have parents weekend, and it's fun to fun to see everyone around with their parents and folks and good stuff. So I'm, I'm sure she's an avid JumboCast fan. Oh, as for well. sure. I told her. I told her I was coming on today. She was very excited. <laughs> so hi, mom. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, in the month of October, we also celebrate Play for Pink. Um, talk to me. Has your team talked about what that message really stands for, or the program as a whole? For sure. I mean, we take it super seriously on our team. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Jackson. He's our SAC representative, representative and doing all the play for pink. But we've got a bunch of guys on our team who've got uh, family connections with breast cancer and struggles and all of that. So it's obviously a super important topic to us. And we try, we make it super serious as a team that we're always representing. I've got our play for pink going oh, on. Oh, look at that here. little merch. I got Jumbo's action. basketball play for pink with we're, it all. We, we got to get you some Jumbo cast merch. Very, very true. Soon. Very true. But yes, <laughs> play for pink is big time and it's it's awesome to see the volleyball teams represent all of our all of our sports today are representing. So it's it's great to see for a great cause. Yeah, I mean, you as a tough uh, basketball team, you, you feel really connected with the other athletes on campus. I mean, other than basketball, what, what would you say? What's your favorite sport to watch? Oh, man. I mean, 
Well, uh, this year we've got number 87, Truman Gettings, at the tight end. He's been a basketball player now out there on hoops. And word on the street is Michael Berluti is going to come and try his try his hand on the basketball court. So we'll see how that goes. So I'm, I'd be inclined to say football, but I also do the, the PA announcing for the volleyball team. Okay. So I, I don't know. I can't pick one. I'll say all of them, but probably football well we, we've also seen you on the sidelines at the soccer games uh, you know celebrating and living it up with of those course, players you know e even if you're just the one picking up the balls you gotta hype them up someone's gotta do it i mean if i'm out there on the sideline and we're celebrating i'm gonna be celebrating too there you go <laughs> there you go well i mean we got a few important questions that we really want to ask when we're here on jumbo all right lay it on me I, I know you're a good uh, you're, you're a big pre-game meal guy right huge what's your go-to pre-game meal oh i mean We've got uh, Alexander's over here in Medford on Main Street. They always deliver a big time bacon, egg, and cheese. So oh. if we've got like an early morning game, I don't like to eat too close to game time. So for the breakfast, the bacon, egg, and cheese from uh, from Alexander's, I think would be the the go to for me. And now living off campus, do you have a favorite restaurant that you picked out so far? I'll shout out La Casha Bakery okay. right across the street. We live a little far from campus, so. Tough students might not know what I'm talking about, but Lakasha <laughs> Bakery is the place to go for a sandwich. For sure, for sure. And how about on campus? What, what you you more of a Dewick guy or more of a Carm guy? I I am Dewick faithful. I enjoy Carm because as I've got a peanut allergy, so they represent for our for our allergy people of the world, and I think that's amazing and that's awesome. There's just something about the Wick, man. They just they really bring it day in and day out. So I'm gonna go the Wick. There you go. Well, we know you're you're a big athlete, but you're a student too. How about what's that go-to study spot? Ooh, study spot. I like a little bit of noise. Like the library is a bit too quiet for me personally. I like Commons. Commons is okay. centrally located. We got some food going on. It's good, lively spot. I'm I'm gonna go with Commons. That's my that's my study spot. Well, you know, if you're ever looking to find Bobby Stewart, you know where he can be. Well, man, uh, we got a big season ahead of us. What's what's that message? What's what's been playing in your head every single day, looking forward into the next season? I think I think just taking it one step at a time. We're not trying to get too ahead of ourselves. Obviously, we got a real long season through the winter. It gets long. It gets cold. All that stuff. I think we just take it one day at a time. Have our best practice, play our best game, all that good stuff. So How about here in the second half? What are you looking forward to? Oh, for the Jumbos? I mean, I was talking with Riley a little bit. We've got, I don't want to jinx anything, but 83 is our points record for Tufts as far as I'm aware. So theoretically, we're on pace for it. So I'm going to be I'm gonna be hoping for 83. I think offense, points, points, points. That's what I want to see. Well, as the Jumbos and Cardinals are coming back onto the field, we got some fireworks on the background. Yeah. All for Bobby Stewart oh, over here. Bobby, it's, it's always a pleasure. We're looking forward to the second half of the Tough Jumbos versus the Wesleyan Cardinals. This has been the Jumbo Zone so far. Back to you, Jared and Henry Burns. And for all of you at home, hope you stay home safely.
so hypnotic magical We are back at the Ellis Oval for this Jumbo Cast production of Tufts Football. We have been in for a real interesting one so far. 42 to seven in favor of the Jumbos is your score so far. Now we believe the Jumbos all time scoring record is 84. So technically they are on pace to tie that. We'll see if that's possible. Now earlier we talked a little bit about Trinity and we did not mention that Trinity lost their first game of the season today to Middlebury 15 to 20 and full disclosure we were both under the impression that because Tufts had lost their first game to Trinity that if both teams won out it would not matter and Trinity would be the champion that is not the case if hypothetically Tufts were to win out and Trinity were to win out it would be co-champion. So now with Trinity having one loss and Tufts looking as they do today with 42 points, a Netscat championship is possible for this Tufts team. And that is news that Jumbos fans have longed to hear. So looking around the Netscat today, the big one, of course, was the loss. 20 to 15, Trinity versus Middlebury, uh, but Amherst as well. 24 to 17 was a score between Williams and Hamilton and Bowden beat Bates 35 to 20. So a lot going on today. Most importantly, that Trinity game and the Jumbos are looking good. What did we see in that first half? Well, we saw a whole lot from Tufts and a whole lot of nothing from Wesleyan. So from Tufts though, you're looking, they only held the ball for 11 minutes, but they put up 42 points. Whereas Wesleyan had the ball for 18 minutes and put up seven. And then if you, you you move over to the passing yards, Wesleyan only 105 passing yards in the first half. This is a team that's averaging well over 270 a game. This is num this number's got to go up in the second half here. Whereas Tufts already has 270 in the first half, you got to figure out how to stop it. I'm really curious to see what Wesleyan's defensive coordinator schemed up at the half here. Things were not working. Cade Moore had 11 targets, nine catches. Clearly, Berluti and the OC have identified that as a mismatch. They want to exploit that. They've been doing it all day. You gotta stop that if you're Wesleyan. So Walsh up to kick off to start the second half. Again, returnable. Brought in at the two yard line and cut up to not quite the 20. A huge hit at the end of that play. Away from the ball. A little extracurricular on that play right there. Yeah, Jonathan Cray, the linebacker for Wesleyan put a big hit on what looked like a block down the field, but regardless, Wesleyan will take over at the 20-yard line. Big number that jumped out for me in the first half, penalties, six for 50 yards for Wesleyan. If you're down 30-plus points, that's not going to help you get back in it. Looking to cut down on that here in the second half. It is Jennifer in the backfield with Candido. Will be a handoff to him immediately, and he cuts forward. A lot of room to run, and he's down past the first down marker. So Jennifer with his longest run of the day. Yeah, first real successful run we've seen from Wesleyan. Like you just mentioned, most successful run of the day. Uh, he, I mean, he's only you know averaging five, five and a five and a buck you know on the day. So we like to see those ten plus yards runs. Thomas Elk Elkowry back in the game after a couple penalties in the first half. Luis Sanchez in the slot to Candido's right. He's got a running back behind him. Two receivers to his left, running back motions to his right. First and 10 on the 32 yard line. Will be another handoff to Jennifer. Diving tackle misses, he pushes forward to his left and the gain of round five. I like to see them establishing the run early. Hopefully it'll move Tufts into a position where that you can then pass. Tufts is just sitting in a cover one man with that one high safety over top, kind of lurking, taking away the deep balls over the middle. But uh, we have not seen Wesleyan be able to run the ball successfully, so I like two straight ahead of schedule runs. Both are four yard plus carries. So second and six. Ricky Eng in the game at wide receiver. In the slot to Candido's right, it will be a pass. That ball goes out quickly, and it is caught by Eng close to a first down. 
Great job recognizing that the, the DB was playing like 15 yards off the receiver. There was a huge hole, and he sat right down in there for a, about a seven-yard hitch right up at the sticks and got the first down. Yeah, they're going to call that a first down, as you said. Tackle by Christian Rosario on the play. It's the first, first time we've really seen Wesleyan be able to get out of their own 25, though, outside of starting in, in positive field position. Yeah, moving the ball quickly, though. The offense doesn't look too different. Ricky N goes in motion. Jennifer takes the handoff and is met immediately and absolutely smothered on the play. Multiple flags come flying in. One man hit him down low. Victor Garza hit him up high. We'll see what the call is. It was Abu Akel who hit him down low. The face mask penalty comes in on Victor Garza. So what looked like a blown up run will be a 15 yard gain for Wesleyan and their first drive of the half is moving down the field. I don't know if they intended to, but they sent a motion right into the side where Garza was blitzing from and effectively blocked him. Although it was a run play, that could be something, you know, we talked about in the first half, how are they gonna stop the corner blitz? Which is something we just haven't seen yet. Well, they get a face mask there. Jennifer remains in the backfield, three receivers split out. It's gonna be a play action fake. Candido moves to his left, keeping his eyes up field. Will he look to run? He will. Cuts up and out of bounds for a good gain of around seven yards. Yeah, found a soft spot in the zone. Nothing was open, and he just kind of, you know, when you have, like, the, the four verticals concept on the left side, you can you can run underneath it because no one's there to, to cover. All your receivers have cleared out. So Candido, not a run first quarterback, but has, had, has made some plays on the ground so far today. Under 13 minutes to go here in the third quarter. Wesleyan moving now at the 35-yard line in Tufts territory. We continue to see this motion from Jennifer. Candido. Quick pass left, and that ball is almost intercepted. Intended for Luis Sanchez, but couldn't get there. Route was jumped and an incomplete pass will bring up third down. I think you got to make those catches, though. That ball was put right on his chest. Uh, he he kind of dropped it just because he felt the pressure, but it did hit him in the hands. He ran the whip route, and uh, Candido stuck it right on him. Yeah, so instead of a first down, a third and short. And we know Wesleyan's been really struggling on third down, you know, two of eight in the first half. So this needs to change coming into the second half. Two men in the backfield. First time we've seen this look for Wesleyan. It will be a handoff and close to a first down, but maybe just a bit short. Yeah, I don't think he got there. That was James McHugh on the carry, his first carry of the game for Wesleyan. So on third and short, they go with a new man, and he's unable to pick up the conversion. I'm sure they hope to pick up the first down on that play, but you know this is four down territory. I mean, it's four down territory pretty much the rest of the game. You got no chance if you're gonna punt. So, I mean, I'd like to see him go back back to the run, though. They picked up about two and a half on that. That'd be enough for a first down if they did the same play again. One man in the backfield. Hand off to Jennifer. Excuse me. It is a play action, and it is blown up. Sacked on the play. We'll bring up, excuse me, we'll create a turnover on down. Shane Reiner comes in, and what looked like an obvious rushing situation was a play action pass for naught. That play call just baffles me. Play action is slow. If, if you're going to put a goal line package out there, you know Tufts is going to send pretty much their entire house at you. And then, you know, when they do, you, you act confused and uh, give up a sack. So, again, he fooled me on the play fake, but he did not fool Shane Reiner, as you can see right there. And a huge turnover on downs forced by the Tufts defense. Bringing up a first and 10 from the 39. Tufts offense back on the field. Berluti in at quarterback. It's going to be a quick handoff to Reese. Moves his feet, makes a cut right. He's got room, makes a man miss, and picks up the first down. So a strong run on first down for Chartelis Reese, and they move the chains. Yeah, it is worth noting uh, Tufts is now up to six sacks on the game, which matches their season total. So they've doubled their season total in one game. So as we've been talking about the last two weeks, something has been unlocked in this Tufts pass rush. They're sending different looks, and they've got production from all over. Now at the 49-yard line, Reese remains in the backfield. Clock ticks below 11 minutes. 
Reese had the ball on first down. We'll see what they do here. It is another handoff to Reese. Makes a jump cut right. Pushes forward and gets close to yet another first down. So he is running hard, and the Wesleyan defense can't do much to stop it. Yeah, after that Wesleyan, uh, you know, fourth down failed conversion, you have to imagine the game is pretty much over at this point, and Tufts is going to milk away the clock for the next 30 minutes. Would not be surprised to see them keep going back to Reese and uh, mixing in Calhoun here, I, I believe. Yep. If, so if Reese comes back off can, the field. If your running back can pick up 10 yards a carry, why not, you know, keep pounding the rock? So they give Chartellus Reese a bit of a breather. Khalid, Cal Khalid Calhoun, excuse me, comes in the game at running back. First and 10, expect them to keep it on the ground, but this Tufts offense, you never really know. Indeed, a handoff to Calhoun. Jumps forward, gain of around two pile of Wesleyan defenders come in on that one, so second and long. Yeah, Calhoun's, uh, you know, usually when he comes in the game, they, they do like to run it right up the middle with him. He's kind of a, a bruiser back, and they like to get two to three yards per carry with him, but uh, only got one on there. I wouldn't be surprised if they went right back to him, though. They have seven big, big guys up front. They're He's really just looking to bully the Wesley in front. On the smaller side, only 5'9", 175, but can really fit through those gaps up the middle. We've seen that before. He's a shifty running back. He can make some moves. Now second and nine. This time a pass. Looks quickly right to Richardson, and that one's caught probably two yards or three yards short of the first down. Yeah, and Reese is on the sideline with his helmet off right now, so I would think they're going to give uh, you know, the other two, Andre Smith and Khalid Calhoun, uh, the rest of this drive, or at least for a few more plays. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is Andre Smith who comes in the game. He had a carry earlier today. So, so far he had, he had a 21-yard carry, a big one earlier today. He's back in on third and two after the completion to Richardson. Interesting to see if they can trust him with a run up the middle. He had one earlier that he busted loose for about 25, but that was his only carry of the day. And you never know, Tufts could throw here on third down. Fleckner at the bottom of your screen lined up one on one. It is a handoff to Andre Smith, pushes forward for more than enough for the first down. Big push from the offensive line and another first down. He's an elusive runner. I'd like to see him get more looks. Every time he touches the ball, he really has that big play ability. He gets loose a lot too. Uh, once he gets into the second level running, it, it's pretty successful. Got some great dogs in the crowd today. Parents weekend, a lot of pets been brought out to the game. Yeah, that's the telltale sign of a blowout is when the camera's trying to find dogs in the crowd. That's actually a jumbo cast uh, tradition, but you're, you're right, 42 to seven. Get back to the action. First and 10 from the 28. Fleckner again lined up one-on-one. -on -one. It is a handoff to Smith. He's got plenty of room cutting left. No one in front of him and another touchdown for the Jumbos. Andre Smith with a huge run and this lead just keeps getting bigger. Just how we were just saying on the last play when he picked up seven yards. This dude every time he touches the ball has breakaway speed, big playability, super elusive. But uh, I mean he must be averaging upwards of 20 yards a carry at this point. He's probably got 60 yards on three carries. And Andre Smith, a guy who has been on this team, he's been playing since his freshman year, mainly a special teams guy, really came into today, not too many rushes in his career, only eight, um, 24 rushes last year, 17 rushes his freshman year, 131 yards on the ground last year. A guy who we know can make plays, he came in today and he's done that with a touchdown right there. Extra point is good. Lead is now 49 to seven and it's coming from all around. Yeah, and with only three carries on the day, he's already picked up 54 yards, which makes him the Tufts' leading rusher, averaging 18 yards per carry. And it's pretty simple if you're the Jumbos. If if Wesleyan isn't willing to step up and stack the box, you're going to run it up, up the middle, and if they do that, you're going to take a shot downfield. So really anything you can want to do as the Jumbos you can do at this point in the game, and just trying to make this a little bit prettier uh, is Wesleyan at this point definitely out of reach? Yeah, it's pretty much pick your poison. I think Wesleyan's taking their medicine via the run game for the rest of the game. They're, they've dropped a lot of their DBs back. They're not letting the Tufts get over top. But uh, when you do that, as you just saw, you, you, you leave your, you know, your the box is light. You can run on it all day. And I think that's what's pretty much going to be for the next uh, 23 minutes. I don't want to speak too soon, but you have to wonder if we start seeing some more guys get playing time here. 42 point lead. Not. Will it not worth it to risk an injury to some of your top guys? 
in a game that is almost surely over. But again, we're still in the third quarter. And uh, maybe that 84-point mark is within reach. Maybe not, as the kickoff is returned at around the 10-yard line. Brought up to around the 25, makes a move and driven out of bounds. Ball does not come out this time. That was Ricky Eng on the return. And Wesleyan will take over, hoping, praying, to move the ball a little bit, milk some clock, and get back on the board. Outside of that one Chase Wilson 50-yard connection, we just haven't seen a Wesleyan player make a play that's, that gives you some juice. Every time it's, it's short yard pickups, it's a two yard run, and then a five yard penalty. It's a, it's a seven yard slant, and then a 15 yard penalty. There's not, you, you have to be able to put together drives with consistency. Yeah, they have 155 total yards on the day, so 33-ish percent of their total yards came on one play to Chase Wilson. They haven't done a lot since then. Now, again, Candido is going to pass on a first down immediately rolls out to his right, keeps his eyes upfield, doesn't see anything, tries to get it down the sideline, it's caught, and a massive hit. It is complete to Thomas Elkowry, but man, I mean, what a hit. Looked like he got hit really up high in the head there. I'm surprised the flag didn't come in. But uh, Jaden Callender on the hit, just an unbelievable play. Good job by Candido. He, he flicked his hand downfield, motioning Elkowry to, to run that uh, sort of just you know, that's, that's backyard football right there, directing your wide receiver where you want him to go. This time a handoff, plenty of room to his right and around a six yard carry. That is McHugh, James McHugh, the sophomore running back, getting some carries late in this one. Tufts has switched into a cover three look, which is not something we often see. But that's a look that really you can have your three guys cover. Uh, you have three guys back to cover the entire field. You don't really let up anything deep, and uh, you know you force them to take underneath routes into the flat and run the ball. So McHugh remains in the game at running back. It's going to be a handoff to him up the middle, quickly met, and a gain of just a couple. And just as I say, they show a cover three look. They switch back into the cover two man that we know and love from Tufts defense. That's pretty, uh, I, I like them switching things up though. Confuse the quarterback more than you already have and, and, and never give him a, you know, a place to get his feet set. And as Jalen Callender got in on that one, so two tackles for Callender on this drive. He's listed at wide receiver, but back there in the secondary and making plays, already had a fumble recovery on this season. McHugh again motions. Really interesting cover three look here. The slot wide receiver is wide open. But it's a handoff up the middle. Had a bit of room going forward, drives to around the first down marker. The chains will move, so McHugh proving effective on the ground so far here in the second half. Yeah, good job picking up the first down. That's not something we've seen a lot on third down from them. I think that's only their third conversion of the day. At this point, you know, you just it's all about getting reps in. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe bust out some plays that you haven't been able to put in the game before, things that you have on the bottom of your play sheet, and... Uh, you know, see what works. At least have some fun. Hard to do, down 42. Candido again rolls right. There's not much going down the field. He's going to throw it anyways. Some contact, but incomplete. No flag on the play. Intended for Devin Hardy, the big wide receiver out of Calabasas. Yeah, Devin Hardy's given the ref an earful after that. Uh, I, I mean, the ball was pretty much uncatchable, but he got hit pretty hard, and... Uh, the rest are letting the boys play tonight. They really are letting them play. We have not really seen any penalties come in down the field. Of course, some false starts, holes at the line, but no pass interferences so far. Going to reset the game clock to 5 minutes and 30 seconds. Candido. It's a pass on second down. Dancing around in the pocket. Pointing downfield, throws to the right side. That time caught by who else but Devin Hardy. Couldn't get it on the last play, gets it on that one, and a first down. Another sort of you know backyard football-esque play, though. Candido's rolling out to his right, and still he's motioning with his hand. 
it just a lot of these plays that they're drawing up does don't seem to be working and it's you know extending the play trying to make something happen out of nothing i i'm not understanding the the route combinations that they're drawing up clearly tufts just has them on lock all over the field yeah a lot of backyard football, as you're saying, and we've not seen him make many plays from within the pocket. We've seen a lot of movement, a lot of waiting around, trying to make something happen. This time on second and 10, it should be first and 10, excuse me. Again, rolls out to his right, throws down field to the end zone, close to the end zone, incomplete. Ball didn't quite get to his man. Looking for Luis Sanchez, but unable to get it there. That's what happens, rolling out to your right, hard to make that throw on the run. Yeah, it, it just seems like Candido has happy feet in the pocket. He, I, I've seen, you know, watched a couple of games, and he, and this is something that you have, you can't see on film is he doesn't like to set, step up in the pocket and take a hit while he throws. He likes, he'd prefer to be on the run and and uh, throw one untouched. But you know, I'd like to see him step up there and, and fit in some some slant routes and some hitches and tough throws. Yeah, got to make the easy things happen first. They haven't been able to do that yet today. Here's Candido drops back, move in again, spins out to his left. A flag comes in. Candido's going to chuck it to the end zone, and it is broken up at the last second. Looked like he had a chance at a touchdown there. We'll see what the call is with the flag, but as it stands, incomplete. I think they're going to get him for a hold in the backfield. That's the problem, though. When every time you scramble, your offensive linemen, you know, they're playing as if you're going to step up into the pocket. As soon as you scramble, they have to pull their guy to hold him back from tackling you. So that's just, you know, I know that penalty is going to be on the offensive line. That's on Candido. At some point, has to step up and make a play within structure. Two penalties. So a roughing the passer call on, it sounded like number 50, Trevor Hillier, and a hold against the running back, Ezra Jennifer. They will offset, will replay the down, so he gets out of that one. But it no, no play will be recorded. He took a shot to the end zone. Actually, looked like he had a chance right there. We yeah. will replay second and ten. Wide receiver really just dropped the ball, I think. So Tyler Flynn enters the game at running back and gets the ball immediately. Cuts right. He's got room and down past the first down marker. So Ezra Flynn with a strong run. Yeah, good jump cut. Found the hole. Uh, good vertical running, too. Didn't was running horizontal, put his foot in the ground, planted and, and, and came upfield. Now it's third and real short. So, yeah. you know, I, I'd like to see them go back to the run and just get yourself a first down. Looked like a first down, but marked just short, as you said. Flynn remains in the backfield. Wonder if they will just, as you said, give him a chance to convert. Tufts brings up five to the line. What I would not like to see is play action. Decide if you're gonna run or pass. It will be a run. But Met immediately driven backwards. I don't think he got there. A huge defensive stop for the Jumbos. Looked like Andrew Franco in on the stop, among others. Hillier just got penalized, but gets in that one and gets a stop. So fourth down, and Wesley, and what choice do they have? Offense stays on the field. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's that's one that the quarterback needs to audible out of. Tufts had six in the box, and you only have five offensive linemen when you run a two-by-two two spread set. It, it's, it was dominated, and then you're going to run out of a weak rush front. I'm not, I'm not understanding. If you're going to commit to the run, why not put a, a run package in? So fourth and two. It's going to be a pass. Looking quickly to the right side of the field on a fade route. That ball is caught. Down at the one-yard line, Thomas Elkowry brought that one in on the fade route, a contested catch. He got that one done. He looked at him immediately on the fade and brought it in just around the five-yard line, out of bounds at around the one. Two men right there, but Elkowry brings it in. That's a heck of a catch. Way to body himself and put him in position, almost box out the corner while the safety's coming in over top, and that ball's fit in right in between the gap. So Wesley in a chance to get back on the board, make this one look a little bit better, but clock continues to tick. We're near the end of the third quarter. It's a handoff up the middle. We'll wait for the call. Not clear if he got there. And it is a touchdown for Wesleyan as they inch just a little bit closer. Yeah, it's worth noting they've now doubled their season total on rushing touchdowns with two today, uh, only one prior to this matchup. But uh, that was a, a good drive. They were able to establish the run a lot. They ran the ball successfully. And uh, 
connected, like I mentioned at the start of the drive when we had only really seen the big play by Chase Wilson, good on Thomas Elkery, you know, putting it on himself to make a play and carry the offense a little bit. Daniel Yoon on to kick the extra point. Almost blocked, but up and in. So that makes the score 49 to 14 with two minutes and 38 seconds left here in the third quarter. Plenty of time left to go, but a big deficit facing Wesleyan. The Tufts offense will get the ball back and it looks like Berluti will remain in the game, but we will see in just a moment. Yeah, I think they'll probably send Berluti out for at least one more drive. It's still the third quarter. But uh, back to Wesleyan, you know, we just mentioned how they had a little bit of success running the ball on that drive. They took a lot of time off the clock. Yeah. I mean, there's only two minutes left. Tufts was able to put up 28 in the first, like, 11 minutes of the game. Uh, unfortunately, Wesleyan just wasted about seven minutes of clock on that drive, and they did get the result of a touchdown, but you need the ball a bunch more times if you're going to have a chance to come back in this game. Yeah, so Wesleyan... Does a lot on that drop, converts on fourth down, gets in the red zone and punches it in with Ezra Jennifer. As you said, their second rushing touchdown as a team on the season. They will now kick it back to the Jumbos. This kick low, line drive, fair caught by Andre Smith at around the five, and the Jumbo offense will come on to the field. Well, if you're the Jumbos here, you can kind of establish your drive. And I would start off... Uh, with two straight running plays. I think you burn about a minute and a half with those, take it down to about a minute and ten left on the clock. Hopefully at that point you're in like third and three situation, you run it a third time. I'd like to see them at least get it to the fourth quarter um, before they have to turn the ball over if they do. So Matt Crowley in the game at quarterback, not Michael Berluti still in the third quarter here. Andre Smith in at wide receiver. The backup from St. John's Prep is in the game, and he will hand off to Smith immediately, who carries down to just around the line of scrimmage. Yeah, they pretty much have the entire backup uh, skill position group in here. Jaden Richardson, Cade Moore, Fleckner are all out. So it looks like they got the second team in. Would be interesting to see if they let Crowley uh, sling it a little bit, though. Yeah, Crowley got some attempts a couple years ago before Berluti took the starting job. Burton and Botsford are in the game at wide receiver. Andre Smith remains in at running back, so a different group from the Jumbos. It's going to be another handoff to Smith. He makes a move but is met pretty quickly and decked at around the line of scrimmage yet again, so that will bring up third and long. It looked like Joe Schaefer was in among other Wesleyan defenders on the tackle. Well, this is clearly a passing down, but I wonder if they trust the uh, senior backup quarterback to to do that, although you're up, uh, you know, over four possessions. So I think you can let him sling it one or two times. Let's so Moret, Botsford, C.J. Burton, Andre Smith, and Henry Fleckner in the game for at the skill positions for the Tufts offense. Crowley is going to pass on third down. Stays strong in the pocket, moves right, looking downfield, throws, and that ball is brought in, but short of the first down marker, it looked like. I believe that was Henry Fleckner. It is a completed pass, but it is short of the first down marker. So a play on the run from Crowley and strong hands from Fleckner. Yeah, but wasn't enough, and Wesleyan's going to get the ball back after this one. You're right, the punt team comes on the field. Clock ticking down under a minute to go in the third quarter. 49 to 14 remains our score. Again, Wesleyan at least playing for some consolation here. The second half has looked a little bit better than the first. Yeah, they're able to force. This is the second time now that they're having Tufts punt this game. So, you know, that's a positive to get another punt out of them. And uh, hopefully you can go down and, and establish another drive like you just did. Ideally, you... You establish a drive in which you score a touchdown in only two or three plays and then hopefully get the ball back. Yeah, really what we saw in the first half, the reason why Tufts was able to run up the score so quickly is all of their drives were only a couple plays under a minute, minute and a half. Even that last drive for Wesleyan was took almost all of the third quarter. Again, the comeback is probably out of the question, but if you want to 
get as many points as possible. Going to have to move a little faster on offense. At the same time, you might just want to get out of here and run that clock down. Yeah, I agree. But in the you know manner of staying competitive, you never want to just give up and and run the clock out. You want to see your you know your guys get some reps. Snap and punt is away, a long, high punt, fair caught at around the 28-yard line. 37 seconds remain here in the third quarter. Wesleyan offense will re-enter the game. They're keeping their starters out there. Flynn in the game at running back. And as I say that, they're keeping their starters in the game. Looks like Chase Vaughn from Milton Mass is in at quarterback, so not Nico Candido. I speak too soon. And Wesleyan looks to make a change. Yeah, it's a five possession game. It's it's uh, surely out of reach now, so get your young guys some reps. Vaughn is a freshman. He's gonna hand off on first down. Gain of round five for Ezra Flynn. Good pickup. It seems like they're gonna just run the same exact offense they used to run with Candido. I know last year, uh, you know, with Candido, they used to have another quarterback who they would motion in. So, you know, Wesleyan's not unfamiliar to having multiple quarterbacks play in a game. Yeah, David Estevez was their previous quarterback slash athlete, first team all NESCAC guy. We haven't really talked about the fact Wesleyan, five guys who were all NESCAC last year graduated. So this is a team that has had success this year, despite the fact that they have lost a lot of the talent that guided them over the past couple years. Whistle on the play. It's the end of the third quarter. Tufts looks happy with the score, as I would assume they are. As I was just saying, Wesleyan dealt with a lot of top guys graduating. Right now, we're going to go quickly to the sideline for a report from Justin. Well, with the Jumbos up big here after three quarters, they've turned to backup quarterback Matt Crowley to finish out this game. Coming into tonight, over his career, the senior quarterback has appeared in 10 games. But despite that, he absolutely has no shortage of high school career accolades. He has won first team all Massachusetts and Catholic Conference Offensive Player of the Year as in Massachusetts at St. John's Prep at my alma mater. In 2018 and 2019, led our team to back-to-back -back MA Massachusetts Division I state championships and to top it all off, as my classmate in German class, he was never short of providing us with a laugh, perhaps a bit at Herr Lynch's expense. Herr Lynch, if you're watching this, hope you're enjoying tonight's broadcast. Back to you, Jared. Thank you, Justin, as Vaughn keeps it on the read option and takes it down close to a first down marker. St. John's Prep indeed, a storied football history there. Matt Crowley, a big part of that. And he will presumably remain in the game for the Jumbos if they get the ball back. Now we're seeing Vaughn at quarterback for Wesleyan. And the crowd goes wild at the news of Trinity's loss to Middlebury, which we spoke about a little bit earlier. Big implications for this game. Vaughn looks right, throws, and that ball is almost intercepted, tipped up in the air. Ruled incomplete on the field. Should have been. Should have been an interception. Too. Threw it into double coverage. Although you get bailed out that day, uh, a big linebacker who's not used to catching passes is back there trying to take it the other way in a contested catch. But uh, in true fashion, this is second team on second team. So I would expect not too many mistakes, but you know your fair share of mistakes when, when you're playing second teamers. Yeah, I've seen a lot today. We haven't seen many turnovers. There was the fumble at the end of the first half, and if you count the snap over the head on the punt, but no interceptions for either team so far. Both teams are generally good at taking care of the ball as this handoff goes left and carried for around five yards by Kellen Walker, the junior from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Lots of guys getting action here late for both teams, and uh, I think we should expect that going forward in a game that has gotten out of reach and uh, was a long time ago. Yeah, this is a strange position to be in from the from broadcast point of view where you have 14, 14 minutes left on the clock in the fourth quarter and you're looking at all second teamers on both sides of the ball. 
Just not a very normal uh, football situation. So third and four to go from the 47-yard line. Vaughn remains in at quarterback. Walker at running back. Going to hand it off to him to the left. Pushes forward. Dragged by multiple Tufts defenders, but strong enough to get the first down. Yeah, Walker's had some good pop in him so far. I think he's had... You know, last two carries have been pretty successful. Five plus yards on him. I think keep feeding him the ball and see what you get. Devin Hardy remains in the game. We saw him a bit earlier. I'm interested to see what he can do again. As I said, 6'4", big target. Guy you kind of want to see make some big plays. He's a junior, still has time left. But also Connor Benedict, number 17, six foot six at wide receiver. They have a lot of big guys out there on the field with a chance to make some plays, but looking like they might keep it on the ground. This time they do again to Walker. This time not as lucky. Loss of round two. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see predominantly run plays for the rest of the game uh, on both sides of the – on both teams here coming out. I don't think uh, there's really much room for passing unless it's third and long. You know, this Wesleyan team has a lot of height in their backup wide receivers. Devin Hardy, 6'4", Lindstrom, who's a freshman, we saw earlier, is 6'5", and Benedict is 6'6". You're not going to get much taller at the wide receiver core than that. But again, if they continue to run the ball, it won't matter much. Second and 12 now. It is going to be a pass, and pressure comes immediately. Can he get rid of it? Yes, he can. Throws that one out of bounds. We'll bring up third down. We really haven't seen one clean pocket all day from Wesleyan. And it's hard to tell if that is entirely to be given credit for the touch defense and the pressure they brought. That time it most likely was, but Wesleyan quarterbacks throughout the day, Candido especially, just did not want to hang in there. At times he moved up in the pocket, but a lot of movement, a lot of pressure, and it's resulted in this score. Yeah, that's often the criticism that a lot of mobile quarterbacks face or dual threat quarterbacks face is because they have the ability with their legs, they never want to stand in the pocket and step up like a traditional pocket passer. But uh, oftentimes that's, that's when your best throws are made. Third and 12, Vaughn throws right and not even close to his receiver. Maybe a miscommunication there, or he was just trying to get rid of it. But a go route, that ball was probably 10 yards short. Yeah, he didn't put enough air underneath that ball. I mean, he had a guy in his face, but the receiver hadn't even looked back yet. So clearly that was supposed to be a more of a shot play than a, you know, a line drive out route type of connection. So... Score remains 49-14, fourth and 12 now. The punt unit will come out on the field. Can't imagine the jumbo offense will be doing much but running the ball at this point in the game. See who gets some playing time late in this one. Punt is out. One of the better punts of the day to Smith. Fair caught. Tufts will take over at around the 18, excuse me, 13-yard line. So even in this type of game, Andre Smith always the man back there returning punts. He's held that role for several years now. Let's see what offense the Jumbos send out on this possession. Yeah, Andre Smith, though, really coming out of a career day today. Not not someone that Tufts usually turns to to run the ball, but uh, having a big day with, with the 54 yards and touchdown that we saw. So Crowley back at quarterback. Jay Sean Means is in the game on offense, and I want to point out number 87, Truman Gettings, the Tufts basketball player who has joined the football team this year, is in the game as well. That ball is taken by Means, and a huge play out to the 40-yard line, and even the Tufts backups, the graduate student and normal defender, Jay Sean Means, the defensive back, in on offense and making plays, so Tufts having some fun late in this one. Glad you got to mention Truman Gettings. I've had him written down on my uh, prep sheet every single week. I've been waiting for them. I was hoping that he could get like a red zone look, a, a little fade route. He's a big guy. Throw it up to him, make him go up and get it. Six foot eight, 225 in at tight end. Don't see that too often in the NESCAC, unless apparently you're a Wesleyan wide receiver. But <laughs> with a penalty on the field, sounds like that one might be coming back. Holding. On the offense is the call. Tufts offense waiting for a call from their sideline. So second and six. Interesting, I wonder if they gave the holding the 10 yard penalty 
based on the spot foul rather than on the previous down. Crowley, again, hands off to Jay Sean Means. Not as big of a gain on that one. See where they spot that. But interesting to see the defensive back, Jay Sean Means, been on this team for several years now, get some play time on offense late in this one. Yeah, good to see a guy who came back as a grad student using his fifth year eligibility to uh, get some burn in a game that's out of reach. So third and four now. We're ticking net close to 11 minutes here left in this one. Crowley with Jay Sean Means in the backfield. Will they keep it on the ground? They will. Another handoff to Means. Pushes forward, but not going to be close enough to get the first down. Get a little scrappy on the field and likely a punt for the Jumbos. Offense is looking like they're holding up out here, asking to go for it. Yeah, we'll see what's going on right here. You're right, the offense is on the field. Oh, you know, it is still third down because that first uh, play was a uh, excuse me. down. So third down it is. We had a mistake on the scoreboard here. Third and two is the down with means remaining in the backfield. They will hand it off to him. He cuts up field. Going to be close. Offense is signaling for a first, but Man, they're gonna give it to them. They will give it to them. Well, conflicting signals from the referees here. One signaled for a first down. One did not. The chains have yet to move. And now they will. So first down will keep the drive going. Tufts clearly looking to burn some clock here towards the end of this one. Under ten minutes we are. Jay Sean Means getting his Inaugural work on offense. Truman Gettings lined up in the slot. That is a tall target. Yeah, tough task for a middle linebacker to guard a 6'8 guy. And they're going to pass. Look to him, and Gettings has it. His first reception as a jumbo. And he'll pick up around five on the play. Clearly, we're looking for him on that one, and they got it done. Yeah, Crowley looked like he was staring him down the entire time, just looking to get the big man some plays. And, uh, now, and now he comes off the there. field. And he's getting high five by the whole team. Great to see him get some use. So 17, I believe, is Matt O'Connor listed at quarterback, but he will be in the game as well. Lots of guys getting action here at the end of this one. Handoff means, jumps to his left, pushes forward. Lots of Wesleyan guys in on the tackle. Modest gain. Enough, however, for a first down, and clock will continue to tick as the Jumbos push down towards the end of this one. Lots of new guys coming in. Luke Leongis, the quarterback, in now, as is Joey DeLumo at running back. So all sorts of new names. Tufts has about seven quarterbacks on the roster as well, so interesting to see how many of them they'll be able to get through with eight minutes remaining on the clock. Yeah, so Crowley out, Leongis in, O'Connor in, but at wide receiver it looks like. Quickly a handoff. Dragged towards the first, excuse me, towards the line of scrimmage. So jo Joey DeLumo gets a carry late in this one. Not too much going. And the personnel shifts continue for Tufts. Matt Greco, the freshman wide receiver, now in the game as well. Longest remaining at quarterback. We see Jonathan Faber, the senior wide receiver, in the game. Guys, we do not usually get a chance to watch are getting plenty of playing time here at the end of this one. Keeper on the read option for Leongis, but he maybe made the wrong choice, brought down in the backfield for a loss, and that'll bring up third down. That's more really one of the first tackles for losses that we've seen from Wesley, and it comes with seven minutes coming remaining in the fourth quarter in garbage time, but 
Good to see them finally get some pressure into the backfield and break through the offensive line. I don't know if that'll be credited as a sack though, or it looks like a more of a designed rush play, as Tufts has really only let up one sack all year, so that'd be a shame if that is uh, what's credited with breaking up that streak. Yeah, can't imagine that'd be a sack. Look like a keeper on a read option, and that sack streak looks like it is continuing. Berludi was not brought down today at all. Leongus now looking to pass. He's gonna roll right, keeps his eyes up field, throws across the middle of the field, and it's caught by DeLumo. Short of the first down marker, however, so across the middle of the field, across his body, not always the right move to make, but completed it right there, and we'll bring up fourth and one. See what the choice is here from the Jumbos. Punt unit is going to come out. Clock continues to tick. By the time they get this one off, it'll be under six minutes. Yeah, it wasn't a super pretty completion there, but nice to see the junior quarterback get, uh, get one on the stat sheet. And uh, the... Good sportsmanship here by the Jumbos not to go for it on fourth and one and punt it over to Wesleyan. Play clock ticking down. Might be a delay of game right here. No, just get it off. That punt is away but very short and out of bounds. We'll see where they spot that. Will not likely be a great punt from Walsh. And out comes the Wesleyan offense. We'll see what... New players will get a chance here late against Tufts. Looks like Vaughn will remain in at quarterback. And Kellen Walker will remain at running back, so it looks like a similar squad to the previous drive, but again, mostly backups for both sides right now. Yeah, wouldn't be surprised to see more of the same with the run plays from Wesleyan. Saw the same from Tufts, and uh, seems like it's just going to be running out the rest of the clock. Vaughn looking to pass on first down, throws right. Paul is broken up. Strong play on the ball by Andrew Alexander, it looked like. Again, lots of guys coming in this game. But ball over the middle, unable to be completed because of a strong break on the ball by Alexander playing at defensive back. So second and 10 and the clock stops. Yeah, that was a textbook breakup right there. Stayed on his back, got his right arm over and uh, broke up right in between the wide receiver's hands. And again, Alexander listed at wide receiver. So we're seeing a lot of different guys in a lot of different places. This time they will hand off to Walker. He will break a tackle, but tripped up for a gain of around five. Yeah, Walker's gonna kick himself or not. Catching his balance there. If he had uh, stayed on his feet, he really had a chance to go all the way. But uh, good shoestring tackle. Interesting to see if they'll uh, let the freshman quarterback sling it another time on third and medium. They're taking out Walker, so maybe you'd have to assume that it'll be more of a passing look unless they want to share the love a little more. Tyler Flynn re-enters the game. He's one of their starters at running back. So third and five. Vaughn is looking to pass. He's going to go to the right side of the field to the sideline. That ball is ruled incomplete by the referee, pushed out of bounds. Pushed out of bounds by... Kyle Hammond, the junior defensive back from Atlanta. And quickly fourth down and the punt unit will come back. So at this point, we have the backup squads in the game trading punts as we get closer to the end here at the Ellis Oval. Yeah, Vaughn has yet to complete a pass 0 for 5 so far. Really have not dialed him up with a, a play combination that's been, I, I don't know, favoring towards his style because everything has been uh, really tough sledding out there to get a completion. And more indicative of just the way that the Wesleyan offense has looked today has not been easy for the quarterback at any point as this punt is up and very short. We'll see what kind of bounce it takes. Bounces out around the 40 yard line. That is where the Tufts offense will take over. So if you were watching earlier, we saw a lot of quick scoring from the Jumbo offense in the first half. They ran it up to 42 points at halftime. Quickly scored here at the start of the second half, but haven't seen much since then. 49 to 14 is the score. Now under five minutes to go, expect the Jumbos to keep the ball on the ground, continue to rotate guys in there. 
Now see the freshman tight end, Eli McElwainy from Georgia also in the game. Lots of different dudes getting action. It will remain Leongus at quarterback. Going to hand it off up the middle to DeLumo. Gain of around three. It's really interesting from Wesleyan because we had talked earlier in the game that they had had multiple games over 300 or 400 yards of total offense this year. And now we're coming at back-to-back -back games with under 200 yards of passing. You know, they're only at 167 yards passing this game. That's really unlike uh, what we normally see from Candido. He, he's a top three thrower in the NESCAC. Uh, you know, fairly, I, I would consider him a consensus top three quarterback in the NESCAC as well, but just two back-to-back -back poor performances from this passing offense. As DeLumo takes a rush up the middle, I think what a lot of what we're seeing, you know, we characterized last week some of uh, – the things that contributed to the Wesleyan loss as maybe a fluke, maybe it was the rain, maybe it was a lot of different things. Now, this week, maybe it's two weeks in a row, but maybe the Jumbo's defense is legitimate, and it has shown this year that against top passing offenses, it can do damage, and today it really held Wesleyan in check. So some credit due to the Tufts defense, but if you're Wesleyan, you got to you know look at the mirror, figure out what has gone wrong the last two weeks, because although they had a chance to win that one at the end of regulation, they only had 13 points. They weren't exactly tearing it up. Yeah, Justin Manning has been doing a great job heading this Tufts defensive unit. I mean, they are the number one passing defense in the league, and they're going to continue to be the number one passing defense in the league after this week with this uh, you know stingy performance that they uh, allowed from Wesleyan of only 167 yards passing. So meanwhile, Leongus completes a pass to Robbie Moret for the first down, and that is good for the Jumbos who just want to kill clock at this point. We'll be under three minutes in just a second. Faber remains in the he remains in the game. Excuse me, at wide receiver, split out to the right. Matt Greco in as well. Hand off to DeLumo. Pushes forward, close to a first down yet again. Four or five more of these carries, and I think Tufts will... Uh, Salt this one away. Yeah, successfully run out the clock. If we look ahead, though, on Tufts' schedule, they have four more games. Three are away, which is really tough. Um, you know, they'll be coming back to us for our final broadcast of the year against Colby on November 4th. But in between that is Amherst and Hamilton, which on paper Tufts is favorited. But, you know, Tufts has lost to Amherst in the past in a time when they should have beat them to sort of clinch their position in the league. And they finished the season at, against Middlebury. Yeah, we've learned with Tufts as Belumo gets blown up on the running play. We've learned with Tufts never to count your eggs before they hatch. Um, We've seen times where they've looked dominant and it hasn't always followed through, but this has been one of their best wins in recent memory. And as we said earlier, they really do now control their own destiny. If they win out, they would at least be co-NESCAC champions. If Trinity were to lose, they could have a chance at being the NESCAC championship. Of course, four games to go, a lot remaining, but better to control your own destiny than to not. You know, and I, I mean, we didn't get to see Tusk play Trinity, but uh, I'd have... After this performance, you'd have to think that Tufts would be either, you know, right in there or favored at this point. Because this Tufts team looks really unstoppable. They're, they're firing on all cylinders. They don't really have a, a facet of their game that hasn't been clicking so far. And uh, I guess the, the worry for me on the schedule for Tufts is Middlebury the final week. That Middlebury team, as we just said, beat Trinity this past week, allowing them to allowing Tufts to now be in co contention for the league title. So on that one, sorry, Matt Greco records his first career reception for the Jumbos, the freshman out of Marin Catholic. He will pick up a first down, and this one is just about over, under a minute left. Play clock ticking down, a high snap. Leongus falls on it, and that will take us to the end of this one. So clock ticking down now, 25 seconds, and that will do it here at the Ellis Oval.
The Jumbos will walk out of this one with an absolutely decisive victory over Wesleyan. What was looked like to be another rivalry close matchup quickly turned into a blowout. 49 to 14 the final score. Tuff scored 42 points in the first half and the streak of six consecutive matchups between Wesleyan and Tufts being decided by one score is over by a lot. <laughs> Over 30 point victory, 35 point victory for the Jumbos. They will walk out of this one happy. Well, Wesleyan will walk out of this one wondering what went wrong. My name is Jared Cohen. I've been joined by Henry Burns on color commentary. You will next see Jumbo Cast covering football on November 4th against Colby. Please stay home safely and have a great night. This has been Jumbo Cast signing off. We're here. We're back on Jumbo Cast. Here with with start with one of the stars of the game, Cade Moore, following this dominant win over Wesleyan tonight. So, Cade, you had eight receptions for 93 yards and two touchdowns. Your first your first touchdown was the first of many tonight. Walk me through those first those two touchdowns you scored. Um, yeah, most of them were just great play calls. It kind of opened up. Um, they were playing man defense on the first one, so we were able to hit them over the top, and Mike made a great throw. So you and Jaden Richardson both had two touchdowns tonight. What's the dynamic with having two explosive receivers on the same offense? Um, it's awesome. Jay Rich makes it easy. Uh, when they start trying to double cover him, it makes my job a lot easier. He's a great receiver. Had great plays tonight like he usually does. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So, so what does this win under the lights on Parents Weekend mean to the team? Uh, it's a huge win. Wesleyan's one that's... Uh, always on our calendar. It's a big game for us, and so uh, under the lights, in front of parents weekend, uh, it's just it's a great, great win. So I'm not sure if you had heard about this, but Trinity lost today. So now you and Trinity and Middlebury are tied at four and one for first in the NESCAC. W being first in the NESCAC, what's the outlook going into next week's game against Amherst? Uh, it's just one week at a time. Doesn't really change anything for us. That's our mindset. So. Um, whatever the rest of the league does, doesn't really matter. We got to look at next week and it's one win at a time. Anyone can beat anyone in this league, that's how it goes. Well, I had a great time watching. Hope you all had a great time playing. We'll be back in a couple weeks for more Jumbo Cast action on football. From all of us, or, or is this it? From all of us here at Jumbo Cast, stay home safely. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's not a classical.